today we deal with the subject of infrastructure. No? Infrastructure is a very big topic. So I split it into two parts, infrastructure energy and infrastructure transportation. In this class, we will deal with oil and gas, coal, power. In another class, we will deal with railways, roadways, airways, ports and shipping. Because it is not cover all the seven topics in one class. Now I want to say a couple of things. As you know, in the IAS examination, they never ask a direct question. They will not ask you to narrate the history of something, nor will they ask you a purely factual question, asking you to narrate the fact, reproduce the facts. The questions will usually be, what are the issues, what are the problems, how problems can be overcome, what are the merits and demerits, what are the pros and cons of some development or some policy or whatever. You get my point? So, mugging up a whole lot of history, geography is of no use. Your school method of preparing, for example, don't bother to know about the history of coal fields in or oil mining in India. The first oil field was discovered here, the first coal field was discovered there, or these are all the oil fields, these are all the coal fields. Don't bother to mug up all those. They, those kind of questions will never come. The questions that may come are, what are the problems with oil and gas industry in India? What is Government of India doing about it? Or what are the problems in the coal sector? Do you think the policy measures adopted by Government of India are adequate to address them? You will get only questions like this, you know, more of thinking questions. And you know my usual style of quotations, terminology and statistics. There are no quotations in these subjects. I looked for them. There is nothing proper. So, so you are spared of the quotations. Now, as far as terminology is concerned, there are plenty, but I will adopt them at the respective places. And regarding statistics, there are far too many statistics, so I will again use them in the respective places. But I would like to tell you one thing, don't be worried or don't be overawed by the statistics. Even if you forget every one of them, if you are able to remember the core arguments, that is enough. Of course, if you are able to rem remember a few key statistics, that will certainly embellish your answer. But assume the worst case scenario that you have forgotten all the statistics. Don't worry. As long as you remember the arguments, the issues, you are fine. Okay? And while I'll, the presentation may have a lot of statistics, I will also make it a point to say which statistics you may possibly try to remember. Try to remember them if you can. But as I told you earlier, even if you forget, doesn't matter. Okay? At the end of each section, I will be quickly summarizing the what we discussed. And please listen to me carefully. If you remember at least that much, it's enough. Okay. Okay, we begin with oil and gas. <coughs> Sorry, before that, I will refer to some references. There's an India Brand Equity Foundation, IBEF. I don't know if any of you have seen this website. It's a very useful website. Please make it a point to see it. Not just for infrastructure. It has got nice articles and presentations on a range of economic subjects. You know, it will be very useful to you. It's a government website. Then I've also listed the annual reports 2017-18 of the ministries of petroleum and natural gas, coal, and power. Now I don't expect you to read the annual reports. Number one, they're very dry. Number two, it's a waste of time. But I have given it for reference. I mean, you don't read the Encyclopedia Britannica from cover to cover. You only refer to it if necessary. When do you refer to this? Supposing there is some, you have some doubt about the, some definition or doubt about some statistic, then you refer to the annual report because that is the authentic one and the figure that the annual report gives the correct one. Sometimes when you see two, three websites, they will give different figures and you will get confused as to which is the correct figure. In such situations, you refer to the annual report. But please make it, make it a point to go through them, go through them meaning browse rapidly and, but don't, what, waste your time reading them, you know. There's a famous saying of Samuel Johnson that knowledge is of two kinds, either you know it or you know where to look for it. It's enough if you know where to look for it. You know that there are three annual reports and if, in, if you have some doubt, you can look it up. It doesn't mean you mug up the whole annual reports. Okay. 
knowing what to read what to leave out how much to read is essential is, is the crux of your success you know it is not just hard work but intelligent hard work which will make you clear the examination okay now we move on to oil and gas oil and gas industry contributes about 15% to india's gdp what does this tell you it's a big industry 15% of india's gdp comes from this India is the third largest consumer of oil and petroleum products in the world after US and China. If some statistics is important, I'll tell you, try to remember this. If I don't say, that means you don't have to, all these statistics I'm giving you, but you don't necessarily have to remember. Where I say, please remember this statistic, make it a point to, or try to remember. India's energy consumption mix, oil 29%, natural gas 7%. You can possibly try to remember this. What it says is, out of if you take 100, coal is some 50 percent, firewood is some 20 percent or something. You know, coal maybe oil is 29 percent, natural gas is 7 percent. Okay, this you remember. The why I am saying we must remember this is because government of India's policy is to reduce the dependence on oil, bring down the oil percentage and increase natural gas percentage because natural gas is environmentally friendly. About 80% of the crude oil required is imported, the rest locally produced. Offshore versus onshore production roughly 50-50, high volatility in the international prices of crude oil. This is the statistics you should remember, 80-20. 80% of the oil is imported, 20% is domestically produced. In the domestically produced oil, it's 50-50, 50% is will be obtained offshore, 50% onshore okay. and as you all know there is high volatility in the international prices of crude oil you know. about 45 percent of the natural gas required is imported rest locally produced offshore versus onshore production roughly 75 25 if possible try to remember this also 45 percent of the gas is imported 80 percent of the oil is imported there it is 50 50 offshore onshore here it is 75 25 India has about 0.3% of the world's recoverable reserve of crude oil and about 0.7% of the world's recoverable reserve of natural gas. At current levels of production, oil should last for 20 years and natural gas for 30 years. This 20 years and 30 years bit I request you to remember. At current levels of production, remember that. But India is not going to remain at current levels of production. Why? We are a fast growing economy, which means our demands for oil and gas will also increase, which means it is not going to last for 20 years and 30 years, it is going to get over much sooner. What does this tell us? That there is a crisis facing India. And without oil and gas, you are really going to be in a bad situation. You agree with me? So, it is imperative that, number one, we increase our oil and natural gas domestic, this one. Two, we also strengthen our we look for renewable sources, more of renewable sources of energy. You are clear about the first slide? Okay. Coal bed methane, CBM, an unconventional form of natural gas that is stored through adsorption in the coal itself rather than in the porous spaces of rocks like conventional natural gas. India has an estimated 2600 billion cubic meters of coal bed methane reserves. Now, coal bed methane is also a kind of natural gas but it is different from the regular natural gas. This one is found in the coal itself. You know, wherever you have coal deposits, you will find coal bed methane. Only in the last 20 years or so, we have been exploiting this. Uh, earlier, we missed it. Whereas natural gas is usually, not always, usually associated with crude oil. Wherever you find crude oil, you will also find some natural gas. Or you may find exclusive natural gas wells also. But those will usually come together you know, in the same basin, sedimentary basin. Whereas coal bed methane is found in the wherever there are coal fields. Okay. So this is one possible. As I told you, we are going to run out of oil and natural gas. But things are not that bleak because India has about 400 years reserve of coal. And which means we also have plenty of coal bed methane. Okay. Now, the oil industry has three segments, upstream segment, midstream segment, and downstream segment. Upstream segment means exploration and production of oil. Midstream segment means storage of oil, you would have seen those big cylindrical drums, you know, and pipes. Downstream segment is 
refining of oil and marketing. You would have seen the petrol bunks, you would have seen refineries. Those are form a part of the downstream segment. Midstream segment is storage of crude oil and transport of crude oil by pipes. Upstream segment is exploration and production. It's fairly simple, okay, three stages. Now, exploration and production, ENP is known as the upstream segment of the oil and gas industry, high risk, high reward. ONGC and Oil India Limited <coughs> in the public sector, Reliance Industries, Cairn India, SR Oil, Jubilant Oil and Gas, Focus Energy and Naphtho Gas in the private sector. As you can see from the chart, ONGC's share is 71%, Oil India is 9%, private sector all put together 20%. So about 80% of the oil exploration work is done by ONGC and OIL, the two PSUs. And all the private sector put together, it's remaining 20%. Government of India's policies in ENP sector are aimed at, so you shouldn't talk about oil and gas sector as a monolith. You know, it is like you should talk about policies for each segment. Policies for the production exploration sector are different from the policies for midstream, storage and transportation sector. And they are different from the policies for downstream, refining and marketing. Okay. So we are now talking about policies for in the ENP sector. One, accelerate exploration, bring discoveries to early production and maximize recovery from mature fields. What does this mean? You have to accelerate exploration. That's You can understand that. Bring discoveries to early production. Sometimes we, we discover an oil field, but we take years and years to bring it to production for various reasons, you know, maybe lack of money, lack of technology, or just plain incompetence, whatever it is. We take this. So we should speed up, you know, and maximize recovery from mature fields, existing fields. You know, we should try to exploit them fully. Reduce oil imports by at least 10% by 2022. Increase share of natural gas and energy mix to 15% by 2022. These are Government of India's objectives. They want to reduce oil imports by at least 10% and increase the share of natural gas and energy mix to 15% by 2022. As I told you here, India's energy consumption oil mix, natural gas share is 7%. So in the next four years, or five years, government of India wants to reduce it to, increase it to 15%. Of course, tall order, but it can be done. Bring substantial investment and latest technology, both private and FDI, especially in the deep water and ultra deep water basins. See, initially we were drilling for oil only in the on land. Then we went offshore, you know, that is shallow water. But plenty of oil is there in the deeper water, means you have to go deeper into the sea. And ultra deep means you have to go still deeper. And that is going to cost a bomb, it's very costly, and it's also very high tech, you know. But that's where most of the oil is. Okay, if you can see the government, see this chart, it says pre-independence era 1886 to 1946, nomination era 1947 to 1990, pre-NELP 1991 to 96, NELP 97 to March 2016, HELP March 2016 till date. I'll explain what these are. Now, there are some terms you should know. First is exploration blocks versus discovered blocks. It's fairly simple. Exploration blocks means you give a company a block of land or seabed for oil exploration, for oil prospecting. Once oil is discovered, then it becomes a discovered block. You understand? Supposing uh, exploration success rate is said to be only 3 out of 10. Well, commercial success rate of the discovered blocks is said to be only out of, 1 out of 10. You remember I said earlier that this is a high risk, high reward enterprise. Why is it high risk, high reward? Because when you explore 10 blocks, your chances of finding oil is only 3. Among the 3, not all may be economically viable or technically feasible. Only one may be commercially successful. So your strike rate is only about 10%. You know, that's why you say this field is very risky. Development of discovered oil fields is rather slow. It should be put on fast track, not more than three years for on land and shallow water and five years for deep water blocks. You remember here I said government of India's policy is accelerate exploration, bring discoveries to early production. 
So presently one of our problems is even though we discover an oil field, we are not bringing it to production immediately. There is a, they are taking a lot of time. So government of India is saying that you should put them on fast track. If it is a on land or shallow water, it should be brought to production within three years. If it is deep sea, then you bring it within five years. I mean, these are, these are all targets may or may not be achievable. The next term is petroleum exploration licenses, PLs versus petroleum mining licenses, PMLs. Don't be psyched by the terminology. The fundas are very simple, basically. Just as you know what is exploration block and discovered block, this co correspond to that. Petroleum exploration license, PEL, is given to you to explore a block. You understand? Once oil is discovered, then to mine that oil, you need a separate license. That is called a petroleum mining license. I, ho I hope you are all clear about this. Petroleum exploration license is given for, dis uh, for the exploring purpose. Once oil is discovered, you need a separate license. That's called petroleum mining license. Normally, the duration of the petroleum exploration license is about 7 to 10 years. You, you can't be given, allowed to dis explore indefinitely. You are given a limited period of time, 7 to 10 years. By that time, you should find out. If you fail to find out, that means it's a flop. Okay. But norm, petroleum mining licenses are usually for a much longer period, 20 to 30 years. Having spent so much money and discovered a successful uh, block, you should be given sufficient time to mine. I hope you agree with that, Panda. So normally, petroleum mining license period is about 20 to 30 years. Depends on where the field is. Okay, now I come back to this history bit. As I told you, one, two, three, four, five steps are there. You don't have to remember this. Just remember the, the last two are the really important ones, NELP and HELP. Now, even when I was a student, the oil sector in India was in the private hands. You know, we used to see, Bur mostly, I mean, it was mostly in private hands. We used to see Burma Shell, SO, Standard Oil, petrol bunks everywhere. So, till 1990, you know, of course, as you know, Indira Gandhi nationalized a whole lot of industries and uh, started, both Nehru and she started a lot of public sector undertakings. At that point of time, they were necessary. Now, in nomination era, nomination means you don't call for tender, you just give it directly. That's what is meant by nomination. Till the end of 1980s, Indian ENP industry was dominated by the two national oil companies, ONGC and Oil India Limited, to whom PLs were granted on nomination basis. Exploration was primarily confined to on land and shallow offshore. Till 1990, we depended only on ONGC and Oil India Limited. They were the two public sector undertakings. ONGC was a very big uh, thing. Oil India was somewhat smaller. So we depended only on these two. And there was no tender. Whatever petroleum exploration license was to be given was given directly. And if they succeeded in uh, discovering oil, mining license was also given to them directly. Okay. Pre-NELP. 28, I'll tell you what NELP is later. 28 exploration blocks were awarded to private companies with ONGC and OIL having the rights for a participation in the blocks after hydrocarbon discoveries. In, after 1990, Government of India felt that we can't depend only on ONGC and Oil India. Let us bring in some private parties. But they were very cautious. So initially what they said, private parties can come in, but if you discover oil, you should give a 30 to 40 percent equity stake in your company to ONGC or OIL. You understand what I'm saying? As I told you earlier, first of all, the strike rate is only 3 out of 10. Discovering oil is only 3 out of 10. And commercial success is only 1 out of 10. Now, what basically government of India is saying is you shoulder all the risk. We will take all the profits and the benefits. Because they are saying after you discover oil, then you must give us 30 to 40 percent stake. So, New Exploration Licensing Policy, NELP. The NELP means New Exploration Licensing Policy. Now, what is the difference between NELP and the previous thing? NELP, for the first time, blocks to be awarded only through an inter open international competitive bidding. ONGC and OIL 
to compete with private and foreign companies for obtaining PELs instead of the existing system of granting them PELs on nomination basis. ONGC and OIL to get the same fiscal and contract terms as private and foreign companies, no mandatory state participation through ONGC OIL or any certified interest of the government. What this means is the special preference given to ONGC and Oil India Limited were taken away. Government of India said, here afterwards, we are only going to put it to international competitive bidding. ONGC and Oil India have to participate in the bid like any other private company or any other foreign company. No special preference will be shown to ONGC and Oil India. And no, that's what it means. You know, they have to compete on, a, this is what is called level playing field, you know, the and they will get the same fiscal and contract terms. That means no preference. They will be exactly treated like any other private company or foreign company. And no mandatory state participation. You remember in pre-NELP, they said after you discover oil, you must give us 30 to 40 percent stake. Now they said no, you don't have to give us anything. You keep it yourself. You market it yourself. So this was a positive step. 100 percent foreign direct investment allowed under NELP. They said you can bring 100%, because in some industries, government of India doesn't allow 100%. It says only 51% or 49% or 76%, whatever. Some industries, it doesn't allow. But here, they allowed 100%, because if you don't allow 100%, the foreign companies won't come. They don't like government of India or some private fellow being a partner, because sometimes you don't like partners, you know. Your partner may be a pain, so you don't like. So they say, we want to be 100%. Exploration exemption from cess and import duty on goods imported for ENP. This is a small thing. Agreement between government and contractor is governed by a production sharing contract, PSC, which was based on the principle of profit sharing. When a contractor discovers oil or gas, he is expected to share with the government the profit from his venture as per the percentage given in his bid. Until a profit is made, no share is given to the government other than royalties and census. Cesses. You remember last time I told you the difference between a tax and a fee, remember, in the local government. Now, says, uh, royalties are like a tax, tax on minerals, you know. Royalties have to be paid anyway. In any case, royalties have to be paid. Similarly, says is an addition to the tax. So, royalties and cesses have to be paid in any case. But only if the company makes a profit, they have to give a share of the profit to government of India. You understand the funda? So, in the bid, they will say, whichever company quotes, supposing block A is being bid, they will say the company which gives us, gives government the highest profit share will get this block, you know, assuming that other things are being fulfilled. So, company A may, company P may say, will give 10 percent. Company Q may say, will give 12 percent. Company R may say, will give 15 percent. Then company R will get the thing on tender. After nine rounds of bidding under NELP for 360 oil exploration blocks, PSCs, that is production sharing contracts, were signed for 254 blocks. Presently, 166 blocks are active and 88 blocks have been relinquished. 117 companies, 15 PSUs, 58 private Indian companies, 48 foreign companies are operating. So, under NELP, over a period of 20 years, from 97 to 2016, 360 blocks, blocks, these are really huge blocks, you know, they will run to several thousand kilometers, square kilometers and all that. 360 oil exploration blocks were put to tender, international bids. But bids were received only for 254. So, only for in, uh, remaining uh, 106, there are no takers, maybe because there was no oil or they thought it was not very productive. So out of 254, only 166 are active now, 88 blocks have been relinquished. And 117 companies, 15 PSUs, you may wonder where did these extra PSUs come from. Some of them are state PSUs and all that, you know. Gujarat State Petroleum also. So many state PSUs also bid for this. Under NELP, 33 coal-based methane blocks have been awarded for ENP, out of which 280 BCM of gas has been discovered. You remember I told you about coal-based methane. So they also put coal-based methane also to auction. And in 33 cases, they have found some gas. Okay, there have been some problems with NELP. As I told you in IAS examination, this is where this becomes important. The questions, I mean, you know, you need to know the fundas, but what is more important are what are the problems, 
what are the issues and how these problems have been overcome or should be overcome. Okay. Fragmented policy framework. Under NELP, there were different policies, licenses and fiscal terms for separate hydrocarbons, oil, natural gas, coal bed methane, shale oil, shale gas, gas hydrates, leading to inefficiencies in exploitation. Example, while exploring for one type of hydrocarbon, if a different one is found, it will need separate licensing, adding to time and cost. Now, this according to me was a blunder. Whoever drafted NELP did not apply their mind properly. Why? Because when you drill for oil, you, you are quite likely to find natural gas. But according to NELP, no, the tender is only for oil. You shall explore only oil. You cannot touch the gas. The gas will go waste also. So, and even if government calls for a, another auction a tender for gas, now somebody else can't be taking advantage of it. Only this fellow can because he only drilled and found out. So it's a, it becomes a bit of a mess. So they should have, ideally they should have had a single license and they should have said whatever you find, it's fine. Whether you find uh, oil, natural gas, coal bed methane, I mean it's not likely to be here, it's likely to be only in the coal fields. Coal bed methane, shale oil, shale gas, whatever you find, you can keep it. That's, that should have been the attitude, but our fellow simply complicated it by saying, for each hydrocarbon that you discover, you need a separate license and there will be separate terms and conditions. Profit sharing was difficult to administer. Under a profit sharing contract, it becomes necessary for the cost to be checked and approved by the government at various stages regarding its necessity and correctness. This process of approval of activities and cost became a major source of delays and disputes. Now, I don't know how many of you here are accounts, how many of you here are accounting background? One. Anybody else? Two, three, okay. Even those who are, do not have an accounts background, I'm sure you know the elementary accounts. In a profit and loss statement, you have at the top line, that is total sales or revenues, and then you have some various expenses, taxes, depreciation and all that. Finally, you get a bottom line, which is the net profit, you know, and the net, <coughs> now when you do, so, usually the top line, that is the sales and this one, you can't cook up. It's very difficult, unless you're a, you know, a big fraud or something, you are not going to cook up the sales itself, revenue figure. But it's always possible to cook up the profit figure. You can, um, by, you know, you can increase the profit or decrease the net profit as you wish by some suitable manipulation of costs, depreciation and other things. You might have sold some land one time, uh, this one, that may come to your revenue, it may artificially boost your profit, but then it's only a one-off thing, it's not going to come next year. Similarly, you can reduce your profit, if you want to reduce your profit, you can artificially boost your costs. No? I'm saying you can include your daughter's wedding cost into the oil exploration cost, and you can show reduced profit. So that's why, that's what it says. Under a profit sharing contract, it becomes necessary for the cost to be checked and approved by the government at various stages regarding its necessity and correctness. You have to check both, whether the cost is really necessary, whether this fellow has included some stray costs which are not to be included at all. And two, correctness, whether the cost is correct or has been boosted, you know. Because there is a, I mean, even if, I mean, there is a incentive for the company to cheat. There's an incentive for the company to show less profit and padding up the cost because then it will have to share less profit with the government. Now, I want you to Google on your own Reliance KG Basin controversy. Reliance KG Basin. KG Basin means Krishna Godavari Basin. Just read about it. You may remember also. See, this Reliance KG Basin was given under NELP to Reliance. I think they struck some 18 gas fields and about one oil field. And this was happened in the 2000s. And they were not sharing any profit with the government. I mean, the government suspected that they were padding up all the costs and cheating on the sharing. So government appointed the CAG and asked the CAG to check whether the Reliance was doing the thing correctly. Now, Reliance went to Supreme Court saying, we are a private company, CAG can, can't audit our accounts and things like that. There is a lot of delay and finally, Supreme Court said, no, 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 this is a quasi-government matter, CAG can audit your books. And 
then uh, ONGC had a neighboring field and uh, ONGC complained that Reliance was sucking uh, oil and gas from their field and cheating. You know? So a lot of issues were uh, uh, coming like this. And so you realize, of course, this is from the point of view of government, that companies may cheat. You look at it from the point of view of company. Let's say you are a genuine company. Now, every stage you go to government and say, the government says, no, I want to check your cost. And uh, some uh, fellow sitting in the government or whatever, without a proper understanding, may be raising a lot of queries. So you are, you get irritated. Unnecessarily, this fellow is raising queries. And so profit sharing is difficult to administer. You understand the point? Next, we go to and exploration is confined to blocks put on tender by the government. There are situations where exploration companies may themselves have information or interest regarding other areas where they may like to pursue for exploration. Currently, these opportunities remain untapped until and unless government brings them to bidding at some stage. Now, in a, there are two types of bidding in government, whether it is roads, bridges, flyovers, metro rail projects, port projects or whatever, you know. For the simpler projects, simpler works, government prepares a design, government prepares an estimate and puts it to bid. Now, various contractors bid, somebody will, whoever is lowest, L1 will get the contract. Now, for, now all the wisdom doesn't reside only in government. There may be fellows outside government who are very experienced, companies which are far more knowledgeable. Let's say about construction of flyovers or construction of metro rail or construction of a port. The companies may have more knowledge than government. So let us say government gives a design and an estimate. The company may say, no, no, this design is bad. This design is poor. This estimate is not okay. I mean, we have a better design. We have a better, um, this one, this is a design we adopted in uh, London or Paris. I think you should consider. So, once a project becomes more complicated, a work becomes more complicated, usually what governments do is, they say, this is our design, this is our estimate, you can bid. But if you have an alternative design, which you think is better, you can say that and you can bid that also. And if we approve your alternative design, then that holds good. You understand this, Fanda? So, whenever the work is, becomes very complicated, for metro rail, for example, even, even for uh, big bridges, big flyovers, big grade separators, like this Katipara junction here, that's called a grade separator. Big grade separators, ports, whenever the work is beyond a certain level of complexity, where the private contractor is likely to have more technical knowledge than the government, government will usually put a condition saying, okay, this is our design and our estimate, but if you think you have a better design and a better estimate, please give that also. So, so the same funda applies here to oil exploration. There are companies, international companies, which have far more experience in oil exploration than government. So the government design or the government estimate, or here it's not the estimate, the government's identification of the oil field may not be correct. They may think government might have put A, B, C, D to auction. Whereas an international company may think, why are these guys putting A, B, C, D? They are not that good. They should have put PQR to auction, or they should have put X, Y, Z to auction. Then the international company will say, look, why have we put ABC? We believe that XYZ are better bets. So they may give their quote for XYZ. The government will immediately include that and it will inform others, other bidders also. Look, apart from ABCD, we are now including XYZ also. If anybody wants to bid for XYZ, you are welcome to. You understand? But in the previous system, it was not like that. If government had bid ABCD, it stays with ABCD. And even though XYZ, I as an international company know that XYZ is better, there is nothing I can do about it. I can only request government, please bid XYZ also. And if government doesn't respond to my request, matters linger. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So this is a new policy, hydrocarbon exploration and licensing policy help, brought about by the present government in March 2016, it replaces NELP. NELP held the field for about 20 years, 19 years in fact, 97 to 2016. This policy is in place from March 2016. Now, it basically it removed all the defects of NELP. First, uniform license. It provides for a uniform licensing system to cover all hydrocarbons such as oil, natural gas, coal bed methane, etc. under a single licensing framework instead of the present system of issuing separate licenses for each kind of hydrocarbons. 
this is a correct move. In fact, it should have come at least 10 years earlier. Open acreages license policy, OALP. It gives the option to hydrocarbon company to select the exploration blocks throughout the year without waiting for the formal bid round from the government. Here, you remember the other fault was only if the government put something to tender. Now they have gone one step further. The company can say, let's say some uh, Rockefeller and co. They can say we are interested in X, Y, Z. And they may directly bid. And government will then put it as a notice saying anybody else interested in X, Y, Z. You know, the initiative for the tender comes from both. Not only from the government, it can also come from the private parties. You follow what I'm saying? Basically, it's trying to remove the the last defect that I mentioned here, you know. Next, revenue sharing contract model. Under this model, the government will not be concerned with the cost incurred and will receive a share of the gross revenue from the sale of, sale of oil, gas, etc. Bidders will be required to quote revenue share in their bids and this will be a key parameter. Remember, I, I told you in profit sharing, costs can be paired up and there are delays in verifying the costs. So, government thought it is not worth it. Let us go for revenue sharing. Remember, I also told you that in a profit and loss account, it is more difficult to fudge the top line, that is the total revenues of the total sales. It is easier to fudge the bottom line, net profit. So, government's assumption here is, the revenues at least this fellow can't cheat. He will, but you never know with the sum of our guys, but the revenues will be given correctly. And now the tender will be like this. If, tender, if the thing is put to tender, if A says I'll give 10% revenue, B says I'll give 12% revenue and C says I'll give 15% revenue, then C will get the block. Okay? Instead of profit sharing, it is revenue sharing. Marketing and pricing freedom has been granted subject to a ceiling price limit for new gas production from deep water, ultra deep water and high pressure, high temperature areas. Under NELP, the oil and gas that the private companies, you know, big, they have to the price limit was put, you know, government will fix the price. In fact, there was a dispute between Reliance and the government on board the price also. Reliance said the price is not enough, you know, and government then I think reluctantly or willingly, I don't know, they increased the price. So, now under HELP, especially when you are drilling oil in difficult areas, when I say difficult areas, it means deep water, ultra deep water, high pressure, high temperature area. Wherever the oil company is drilling from deep, difficult areas, then some pricing flexibility is given. It should be given because oil company will say, you can't treat us, we are going at 10 kilometers into the Bay of Bengal or into the Arabian Sea, you know, 50 kilometers, and somebody who is drilling in the shore or in the shallow, you can't treat both of us the same. I am taking much more risk, you know. Longer exploration phase for on land and shallow deep water, 7 to 8 years, they increase the exploration license period slightly. For shallow water and on land, they increase from 7 to 8 years. For deep water and ultra deep, they increase from 8 to 10 years. Concessional royalty for shallow water, deep water and ultra deep water areas. Remember I told you royalty is a tax on major, major minerals, oil also, there is a royalty. For difficult areas, government gave a concessional royalty. Now, this is, HELP is over with this. These are two additional funders. I will tell you what they are. Seismic survey of unappraised areas. Almost half of India's 26 sedimentary basins are yet to be appraised for potential oil and natural gas reserves. This rupees 3000 uh, crore program is likely to be completed by 2019-20. Now, for oil and gas are normally found in sedimentary basins. River or sea, sedimentary basins. You will find... Kaveri Basin has got oil and natural gas, Krishna Godavari Basin has got. So, most river basins are likely to have oil and natural gas deposits. Similarly, in the sea also. Now, 26 sedimentary basins have been identified, but appraised is not same as exploration. Exploration is different. Appraised means you do some seismic study, you know, and you do a study and you have an idea that, okay, there may be oil in this block. And then you put it for tender for exploration. You understand? So, that seismic survey also our fellows have not done all these years. Only for 50% of the sedimentary blocks, seismic survey has been done. Remaining 50%, it has not been done. Now it's being done and hopefully it will be completed by 2019-20. National Data Repository, NDR, 
provides all geoscientific data to ENP operators, would be bidders for R&D and academic purposes. Now, let us, this is basically like a your book bank or question paper bank. Now, let us say government is putting blocks A, B, C, D for auction. I am a um, bidder sitting in New York. She is a bidder sitting in London. Now, how do we participate? Unless we have some information. We need some information about the oil industry in India. So, we may need to know what are the other blocks that have been given in the past, what are the blocks explored by ONGC, Oil India, Reliance and other private fellows, where are they? And uh, because if you are too close, somebody may steal from yours or you may steal from them. So, I am just joking. I mean, so, they would basically like to know where they are, you know, and they like to know about the person. So, unless you give them the information, you may not get any bits at all. You follow what I am saying? So, you need to give all the necessary information to the potential bidders. Not only the potential bidders, even existing operators may need that information. R&D purposes, you may need the information. Students doing PhD may need that information. So, that's why I said National Data Repository, it provides all geoscientific data to ENP operators, would-be bidders, R&D and academic purposes. You understand this one? These are all necessary. Unless you do all this, you are not going to boost your oil production. Otherwise, you may put for tender, but there will be no bidders. They will say, we can't bid in the dark. We need to know something more about the oil industry and about the state of the blocks, you know. Okay, we have finished the upstream segment. Now, we go to the midstream segment. The midstream segment is involved in the storage and transportation of crude oil and natural gas. The total length of pipelines transporting petroleum products in India is about 15,000 kilometers, the bulk of which is in the public sector, IOCL, BPCL, HPCL, ONGC. Basically, pipelines transport oil from crude oil from the ONGC storage thing to the refineries, IOCL, BPCL, HPCL are all refinery uh, oil uh, refining companies and marketing companies ONGC is a crude oil producing company now we have about 15000 kilometers of pipeline as far as oil is concerned pipeline length is just about okay but as far as natural gas is concerned we have a serious shortage of pipeline length about 16500 kilometers length of gas pipelines is under operation two thirds of it owned by gas authority of india limited gale and the rest by Gujarat State Petronet Limited, GSPL, ONGC, etc. Another 13,500 kilometers length of pipeline is under construction, low capacity utilization of gas pipelines. I will explain to you later why gas pipeline length is inadequate. Now, you take USA. Of course, USA is geographically much bigger than India, maybe twice as big, thrice as big, whatever. They have 3 lakh kilometers length of natural gas pipelines. How much? 3 lakh. Whereas India is only 16,500. Even if you multiply by 3, it still becomes 50,000. So, it is not enough. So, you realize straight away that our coverage is inadequate. You know. See, unlike oil, which is used, it needs to go only from the production center to the refining center. And then from the refining to petrol bunks. There it doesn't go by pipe, it goes by uh, lorries and uh, tankers like this. Whereas natural gas, it will be used throughout the country. It will be used in industry, it will be used in houses, it will be used in commercial establishments. So, the, naturally the pipeline network that you need for natural gas must be greater. You understand this point? In foreign countries like U uh, Europe and, uh, you know, in European countries and so on, you, just as you have a water connection to each house, water pipe connection to each house, you also have a gas connection. Every house will have a individual gas connection. Here we have these cylinders and uh, the fellows, there they have gas connection which is used for the heating purpose and also for cooking purpose, you know. Domestic natural gas versus imported regasified liquid natural gas, LNG. Qatar 62%, Nigeria 14% and Australia 5% are major suppliers of LNG. Now I told you at the beginning that only about 55% of natural gas produced in India, 45% we are importing. So, as you know, so we have to import about 45% of natural gas. You obviously can't import gas in gas form because gas occupies too much volume. You have to necessarily liquefy it. That liquefied natural gas is called LNG and that is transported under pressure in ships, big ship tankers. There will be some LNG tankers which allows, you know, 
and they will come and once they reach the port, you need what's called an LNG terminal to regasify the liquid NNG back to gas. You understand the funda? So natural gas, when you are importing it, you have to import it in liquid form. That's called LNG, liquefied natural gas. And once it reaches the port, you have to regasify the thing. To regasify, you need what's called an LNG terminal. Now we don't have enough LNG terminals. We have only four LNG terminals. They are the Hage at the, uh, all on the western west coast, the Hage, Dabol, Hazira, and Kochi with regasification capacity of 30 million metric tons per annum. Two LNG terminals, Mundra and Ennur, are under construction. We need many more. You know, you understand? And our main, mostly we are importing natural gas from Qatar. You know, Qatar. See, so this is a map. This is a US map. That's why the borders of Kashmir are wrong. I put a note before borders shown in this map are not correct, so that one of you doesn't sue me for sedition or you know, or as a anti-national or ultra-naxal or you know, urban naxal or whatever. So, so I make the qualification that this is a U.S. map because I couldn't find any Indian map giving all these details. Look at the detail how well the, this is a no, from a note prepared by for the U.S. Congress. See, they seem to have done a much better study of our uh, in the natural gas industry than our own people. Now the green four squares are LNG import terminals. You remember I told you that double, or the, you, one is in Maharashtra, one is in Cochin, Kerala, two are in Gujarat. The blue circles are natural gas powered fire plant, uh, power plants. You find them distributed all over uh, India. And mostly the, if you find, and those uh, pink is natural gas fields. You will find them, you know, wherever the oil fields are there, you also find them. This is the Krishna Godavari Basin in the west and Gujarat and in the northeast in Assam. And natural gas pipelines operating the, the continuous lines under construction thin lines. You find that the coverage is not enough. As I told you, unlike oil, crude oil and petroleum, it is enough if you take it only up to the refineries. Whereas natural gas, you need to take it all over the country. So you need a much better pipeline network for natural gas. Natural gas domestic plus LNG is allocated for fertilizers. 30% of the natural gas is used for fertilizers. Power 23%, city gas distribution 14%, other industrial uses 33%. This is just for information. You never know, it may come as a question in the you know, prelims also. You know, what is the major use of natural gas? You know, it's for fertilizers. Actually, it's used mostly for fertilizers. City gas distribution CGD is in a specified geographical area of the country. It, in, it includes compressed natural gas CNG used mainly as auto fuel and piped natural gas PNG used in domestic, commercial and industrial segments. You remember in Delhi, the Supreme Court has said all vehicles will use only CNG, compressed natural gas, because it is not polluting. No question of using petrol or diesel. So CNG is used as auto fuel. Now I have often wondered before, why is it being used only in Delhi? Why, not? Why didn't they make it uh, mandatory for the whole country? They didn't make it mandatory for the whole country because network is very poor. Natural gas CNG is not available in the whole country. But supposing network becomes better, then so sooner or later you may have a condition that if you should use only CNG vehicles for public transport and things like that. Pipe natural gas is used in domestic, commercial and industrial segments. You know, even in India, in many places you have piped natural gas, just as in the West, I told you, each house has got a, like a piped water supply, they also have a piped natural gas. In India also, in many places we have piped natural gas. Gujarat, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Delhi, NCR, NCR means National Capital Region, which are closer to domestic gas sources, LNG terminals and cross-country natural gas pipelines have almost two-thirds of natural gas consumption. Other states and UTs have limited consumption increased pipeline coverage and a national gas grid are needed. Now, if you see this thing, most of the consumption is in Gujarat, Maharashtra or Andhra Pradesh or in Delhi. And they account for almost two-thirds of the natural gas consumption. All the other states put together is only one-third, the reason being poor pipeline coverage. So what we need is a better pipeline coverage and a national gas grid. India is contemplating natural gas supply via international pipelines Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, TAPI pipeline, Iran, Pakistan, India, IPI pipeline, Russia, India. Because we have only been talking about this, nothing has happened. 
you will occasionally you will come across some news item saying the problem is it has to come through pakistan or it has to come through china and both of them are not exactly our friends so this i don't think this will really take off though this is a cheap or cheap option you know from getting from turkmenistan or getting from iran and getting from or from iran you have to lay under under the sea and bring it it will be very costly coming across pakistan would be cheaper similarly turkmenistan via pakistan also afghanistan and pakistan also is cheaper so anyway you must remember so this is all about midstream you understand midstream is mostly i would dealt with only natural gas because there are issues in natural gas in midstream there are no issues in crude oil in midstream because pipeline network for crude oil is sufficient but for natural gas it is insufficient last we go to the downstream segment this is the refining of crude oil and marketing india's refinery capacity 247 million metric tons per annum refining capacity exceeds domestic demand excess is used for exports petroleum products account for 17% of india's exports so you may remember dhirubhai ambani the founder of reliance he foresaw even in the 1980s that there is a market for petroleum oil refining you understand though india is deficient in uh, own oil but he knew that india will always be importing crude oil and though iocl bpcl and hpcl in the public sector are also refining oil there will be need for private sector refineries also so this follows force or reliance success was basically because of oil refining and petrochemicals okay so he started way back in the 1980s sr oil also started so these are the only two big players in the private sector now in in fact in as far as refining is concerned india has got excess capacity we have got excess capacity so we are refining and exporting also we are refining supposing bangladesh uh, crude oil we may be refining and exporting it or some things like that so as what it says refining capacity exceeds domestic demand excess is used for exports petroleum products account for 17% of india's exports there are 23 refineries 19 in the public sector 3 in the private sector 2 as joint ventures and their shares are 57% is to 36% is to 7% so you find that in uh, refinery sector privates have a bigger share iocl i hope you know what is iocl indian oil corporation limited bpcl bharat petroleum corporation limited hpcl hindustan mrpl madras refinery uh, sorry mangalore refinery is petrochemicals limited cpcl chennai petrochemicals limited these are all giants in the public sector the reliance industries sr oil giants in the private sector bharat oman refinery limited hpcl mittal energy limited they are joint ventures the shares are given you don't have to remember all these shares with this we finish oil and i hope you are fairly clear about this okay let me quickly summarize listen to me carefully oil and gas industry contributes about 15% of india's gdp so it's a very important sector we are importing about 80% of our oil requirements and about 45% of our natural gas requirements because we are deficient in oil our oil reserves are likely to last only for 20 years and natural gas reserves are likely to last only for 30 years at current levels of course levels are not going to remain at current levels because india is a rapidly expanding economy which means we are going to run out of oil and gas much sooner okay there is also what is called coal bed methane which is a variant of the natural gas that is available in coal beds wherever coal is found you will also find coal bed methane we have failed to exploit it effectively in the past now the government is going to exploit it better we have 400 years of coal reserves so which means we can exploit coal bed methane if we exploit coal bed methane properly we can go a long way and i told you there are three segments upstream midstream downstream upstream is the most important of the lot and that is exploration and production the big players in public sector are ongc and oil that is oil india limited accounting for 80% private sector 20% now i told you the difference between exploration blocks and discovered blocks i told you the difference between petroleum exploration license and petroleum mining license nomination era they were just given a nomination to ongc and oil india limited in pre nlp they were given to a few private companies but they were told if you strike oil you have to share with us you know you have to give a stake to oil india and this one 
which was nobody will come forward on those terms. Then NELP, for the first time, it was put for bidding, international competitive bidding. The special preference given to ONGC and OIL was removed. They were on the same footing as the any private player or international player. But there was a profit sharing and 254 blocks, they signed the production concrete, only about 189, 188 are operative. Problems were fragmented policy framework, profit sharing was difficult to administer, exploration confined to blocks put on tender. So HELP introduced by this government, overcame all those problems, uniform license, open acreage license policy, revenue sharing contract model, marketing and pricing freedom for difficult areas, wherever you oil market longer exploration phase, concessional royalty for difficult areas. And seismic survey of 50% of the sedimentary basins are yet to be surveyed and national data repository has been created. Midstream segment is storage and transportation. Oil pipelines length is okay, but natural gas we have a serious shortage. And when we import natural gas, you import it in liquefied form which has to be regasified for which you need LNG terminals. We have only four LNG terminals. On the west coast, we need more on the east coast also. And you, as you can see, the oil, natural gas consumption is more in Gujarat, Maharashtra, Delhi and Andhra Pradesh. The rest of the states is very less because of inadequate pipe coverage. <coughs> Downstream segment, refining and marketing. And as I told you, India's refining capacity is in excess. So we are actually exporting refined oil and some petroleum products. We have 23 refineries and public sector, private sector, joint sector, all three are contributing. I hope you are clear about oil sector. So the question can come like this. What are the problems? Usually they won't ask about all three put together. They may ask mostly about exploration production. They may also ask about distribution in the midstream in the case of natural gas. Okay. What are the problems in oil exploration sector? How do you think government of India has address this issue. Do you think help is really sufficient or would you suggest something more or something like that? It may, question may come or question may come saying India wants to reach 22 percent, sorry, 15 percent natural gas consumption by 2022. What are the hurdles in achieving this goal? Then you have to talk about inadequate natural gas pipeline, inadequate LNG terminals and uh, international pipelines not coming through because of Pakistan and China. Okay, this is, these are the two potential questions. Now we move on to coal. Now you have peat, which is a precursor to coal. It is not coal. No, plant and uh, this material under pressure, heat and time. Initially it becomes peat and then it becomes lignite, then subbituminous coal, bituminous coal and anthracite. Anthracite is the best coal. Lignite is an inferior coal. I am showing this only to show the difference between lignite and Coal, regular coal. Okay. In terms of carbon content and heating value, anthracite is better than bituminous coal. Bituminous coal is better than subbituminous coal. Subbituminous coal is better than lignite. Why am I talking about lignite? As you know, India has fairly good deposits of lignite. Tamil Nadu itself, in fact, Tamil Nadu has the maximum deposits of lignite, followed by Rajasthan and Gujarat. So you have the Naivali Lignite Corporation, and you're all aware of lignite. So I would like to talk briefly about lignite. Lignite or brown coal is the geologically younger, lowest quality coal that is located relatively close to the earth's surface. So underground excavation is not necessary, open cast mining. Low carbon content, high moisture content, high volatile matter, more polluting, prone to spontaneous combustion. Because of its high weight to heat, Heat value ratio, it is expensive to transport and is used in power plants close to the mine, example Naivali. Basically what we are saying here is lignite is a geologically younger, lower quality of coal. And because it is geologically younger, it is found closer to the surface. You don't have to dig very deep, open cast mining, that is you don't have to put tunnels and go in, underground mining is not necessary. But lignite has got some problems. Because it is geologically younger and it has got low carbon content. Low carbon content means low heating value also. It has got high moisture content, high volatile matter, unnecessary impurities. It has got more and it is also more polluting. And it is prone to spontaneous combustion. Suddenly it may catch fire. So the risks of fire accidents are there. 
and because lignite does not have much heat value, it is not worth transporting it to far off places. No, you do not put up a power plant in uh, let us say Kanchi, uh, sorry, Kanpur and transport lignite from Rajasthan or uh, Gujarat or Tamil Nadu, it is not worth it. The economics will not, transport economics will not worth it. As far as lignite is concerned, the power plant is best put up by the side of the mine itself. You understand this funda? Okay. India has 45 billion tons of lignite reserves. All this you do not have to remember. Basically, you have to remember that lignite is an inferior form of coal and it has got some, uh, because it is geologically younger, it is found near the surface. Mining is easier, but its heat content is less and uh, it is not economical to transport it. So, the power plant must be located right next to the mine. It is enough if you remember this much of funda. India has 45 billion tons of lignite reserves, mostly in Tamil Nadu, Gujarat and Rajasthan. Lignite production in 2017-18 was 25 million metric tons. Okay. This is all about lignite. Now we move on to coal. There are two types of coal, steaming coal and coking coal. Steaming coal is obvious. It's produced, the name is itself tells you that it is used to produce steam. The steam will drive a turbine. The turbine is used to produce electricity. Okay. What is coking coal? Anybody knows what is coking coal? Okay, now coke is not Coca Cola, it coke is a different, you know. Coke is good quality coal, that is bituminous coal or anthracite. If you heat it and remove all the vapor and all that, heat it without air to high temperatures, then you will get a pure condensed carbon, which is, I mean, compressed carbon, which is called coke. Now, coke, coking coal or coke is used as a raw material in iron and steel industry. If you know, iron by itself is brittle and prone to rusting, so you need to put some carbon to make it steel. That carbon comes from the coking coal, you understand? So, whereas steaming coal is a fuel, coking coal is a, you do not use it as a fuel, you use it as a raw material in the iron and steel industry. So, thermal coal or steaming coal is burned for steam to run turbines to generate electricity either to public electricity grids or directly by industry consuming electrical power such as chemical industries, paper industries, cement and brickworks. Metallurgical coal or coking coal is used in the process of creating coke, coke necessary for iron and steel making. Coke is a porous hard black rock of concentrated carbon that is created by heating bituminous coal without air to extremely high temperatures. You understand? You must have good bituminous coal deposits that you heat it into, heat it without air you will get concentrated carbon that is coking coal, okay. That is used as a raw material in steel industry. India is the fifth largest coal resource in the world up to 300 billion tons, enough to last for the next 400 years. You do not have to remember that figure, but remember that 400 years figure, okay. India's coal reserves are enough for 400 years. Coal deposits are primarily found in eastern and south central India, Jharkhand, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, West Bengal, Madhya Pradesh, Telangana and Maharashtra account for 98 percent of the total known coal reserves in India. So, coal is not uniformly distributed through India, it is found only in the eastern and south central India. Can you tell me what is common to these states? Yeah, all of them are Naxalite affected states. In fact, I will tell you later, they became Naxalite affected because of the coal production. I will tell you how. Coal production was is to coal import is 76 percent to 24 percent. So, unlike oil where we are importing 80 percent, in coal we are importing only 24 percent. In fact, we should be importing much less. Why are we importing even 24 percent? That should be your question. I will come to that. India's coal production in 2017-18 was 688 million metric tons. Two large PSUs, Coal India Limited, CIL and Singareni Colliers Company Limited, CSSL account for 92 percent of the coal produced. CIL is 153 ongoing projects at various stages of completion. So, in the oil, ONG, the oil exploration side, you remember there are two big PSUs. One was ONGC, another was Oil India Limited. Here you have Coal India Limited and Singareni Colliers. Coal India is a behemoth, it is a very big PSU. Singareni is a smaller thing. But unlike ONGC and Oil India, which are reasonably efficient public sector undertakings, Coal India is a terribly inefficient public sector undertaking, perhaps one of the worst. If you rank among the various PSUs, Coal India is a very bad 
one of the bad uh, PSUs. In fact, you will also see that whereas government of India adopted one set of policies in oil exploration, if you remember in NELP, they went, they called for international competitive bidding in 1997 itself, you know. In coal, they adopted an entirely different set of policies, though the problems were the same. And in power, they did something else. In all three, the issues were the same. Government of India, one thing in oil, another thing in coal, third thing in power, okay. India's coal import in 2017-18 was 213 metric tons, million metric tons, 47 MMTs of coking coal and 166 MMTs of steaming and other coal. Now, coking, domestic coking coal is inferior in quality to imported coking coal. Imported coking coal fulfills 65 to 70 percent of the demand. Around 75 percent of India's coking coal imports come from Australia, the rest from Canada, USA, Russia, Indonesia, etc. As I told you, there are two types of coal, coking coal and steaming coal. Coking coal, India's deposits are inferior. So, we have to necessarily import it about 70 percent we are importing, mostly from country, countries like Australia, Indonesia and all that. Domestic steaming coal, ideally we shouldn't be importing steaming coal. We have plenty of coal deposits. Of course, our coal, steaming coal is also of lower calorific value and high ash content. Indian power plants using a domestic coal supply consume about 0.7 kg. Okay. Basically what it means is our domestic steaming coal is inferior to international coal. But still, you can make up by using more coal. Why should you import? The reason why we are importing is because coal India is terribly inefficient. It is not able to supply the required requirements. If coal India were able to supply, then there is no need to import at least steaming coal. If you notice, out of 237 million metric tons, only 47 is coking coal, 166. That 166 could have been avoided, you know, if our coal India was functioning properly. Though GOI has been pushing thermal power plants to go in for domestic steaming coal due to serious supply shortages from Coal India Limited, import of steaming coal becomes necessary. Steaming coal is imported largely from Australia, Indonesia and South Africa. So you understood this funda about coking coal and steaming coal. Ideally we should not be importing steaming coal but because Coal India is so inefficient we are importing steaming coal also. And uh, the two favorite destinations, and I must also tell you here as a joke, part joke, part truth, that many of our corrupt politicians and bureaucrats have bought coal fields in Indonesia and Australia. Now, they all seen potential and they have bought coal fields, you know. So, you just, you can do your own research as to who are the, who are these potential, uh, you know, ministers and all that. But I know of some uh, IAS officers, who, corrupt IAS officers who have got coal fields in Australia and all that. And, and there are guys who have got coal fields in Indonesia, you know. So, this I am sure after listening to this bit, you will remember Australia and Indonesia, even if you forget the <laughs> other country. Okay. Problems with coal industry in India. Now, this may be a potential question. See, what we discussed till now, they are not going to, in the, they will not ask what is, uh, you know, in prelims they may ask what is coking coal, coking coal is used for, they may ask a question like that. But, the mains, the likely question will be, what are the problems, ailing uh, problems with the coal sector in India, you know. Now, please listen carefully. Near monopoly of Coal India Limited, low operating performance compared to global peers and high production cost. Wherever you have a monopoly, people start taking things easy. You know, competition, monopoly is bad, competition is good. Not just government monopoly, even if it's a private sector monopoly, the fellows will be as bad as a government monopoly. So the funda is not whether it is private or public, the funda is, is there a monopoly or competition? If there is a private monopoly, so let us say tomorrow Geo becomes the only telecom um, uh, provider and becomes a monopoly. You can be sure that Geo is going to misuse that power. They will arbitrarily increase their rates, they will do all kinds of things. Even though significant growth has been achieved in coal production since 1973, still a lot has to be done. Many existing power plants are either idle or operating at suboptimal levels due to CIL's inability to match the demand. Many new projects have to rely entirely on imported coal. Now, this may come as a surprise to you. Many power plants in India, you know, they operate with one day's stock of coal, three days stock of coal, seven days stock of coal, virtually hand to mouth because CIL is not supplying coal regularly. Sometimes they have to import. Import also takes a lot of time, you know, it has to come by ship and all that. So, <coughs> 
and supposing you want to put up a new plant and you want to put it up on coal with a, with a coal based plant so coal india limited will say sorry boss we are already tied up we are not able to supply properly even to the existing uh, power plants so we can't assure you of any tie up so then you have to only depend on imported coal understand that's what i meant here many existing power plants are either idle or operating at sub optimal level due to coal india limits limited inability to meet the demand many new projects have to rely entirely on imported coal since coal deposits are confined to a few states cost of transportation is high for the coal consuming industries unfortunately coal is not uniformly distributed it is confined only to a few states so if you put up a coal plant let's say in uh, tutikore you know the power plant in tutikore you have to transport all the way from either maharashtra or jharkhand or odisha so it will the transportation costs are going to be high old and outdated coal mining techniques subscale mining operations a dearth of underground mining technology diminishing recovery rates sluggishness in mining practices little r&d by coal india limited goi more interested in getting a healthy dividend than in allowing cil to invest in modernization these two issues are linked so i'll explain to you what it is as i told you those even if you are not a student with an accounts background this i told you already there is a top line total sales or revenues then some expenses dividend interest payments taxes and all that then you get a net uh, not dividend depreciation uh, taxes this one then you get net profit and from the net profit either you can give dividend to the shareholders or you may keep them as reserves for r and d purposes or future expansion purposes let's say microsoft makes a lot of uh, makes a net profit x in a particular year now microsoft has the option either to give dividend to all the shareholders or to retain all of it it can give as a dividend or all of it it can retain as reserves it may think no we need to do some r and d or we may need to expand our operations or we may need to buy some other uh, you know uh, company so how it may do both it may keep give some dividend it may keep some money for r and d and expansion okay now what coal india has been saying is, uh, complaining is whatever net profit we make not because of their efficiency but because of no you know whatever because they just increase the price and make net profit so whatever uh, net profit we make government of india is taking all of it as dividend you now from government of india's point of view i mean i mean to say in tamil ivan mala itna selavu pannade podum edo kadikirada eduthu porom you know so government of india feels that we have spent hell of a lot on uh, developing the coal sector we are entitled to as a shareholder we are entitled to get the dividend you know and the government of india will say okay if you are really going to expand we will give you money at that time you don't don't bother and anyway i don't think you guys can expand we need to go to private uh, this one or international players so government of india has also been taking away whatever profits coal india has been making taking them away as dividend leaving very little with coal india for r and d purposes or expansion purposes as a result i go to the earlier para old and outdated coal mining techniques so coal india is still having very old and outdated some manual techniques are also there which is very stupid subscale mining operation subscale means small plots you know in agriculture the bigger the field mechanization is better output is better if you have small uh, plots you know it is usually sub optimal the same fund applies here coal india did not take big plots they were taking because their technology is small in uh, poor they are also operating in small plots a dearth of underground mining technology <coughs> they are not they really are not up to date in underground mining technology diminishing recovery rates and sluggishness in mining practice even existing coal recovery rates are diminishing just like you know in a water you might have seen bore wells initially for 3 4 years they give a lot of water then they becomes diminishing same funda here also power shortage and fires also hamper mining work many coal mines are located in naxal affected areas i told you that i'll explain why this happened no i don't know if you heard of this land acquisition act you know that is what is called a right of eminent domain eminent domain it's a english term which says that all the land the government has a right to acquire anybody's land the old funda was that all the land belong to the king and all you guys are using the land only at the king's pleasure you know so government king can always take it back now of course you own your land but government has a 
right to take the land for any public purpose. That's called, uh, for that government resorts to what is called land acquisition. In land acquisition, typically there is a notification saying we propose to acquire these lands. Paper ads are also issued. Then the affected parties can, you know, represent to a land acquisition officer. He will simply note all your things, but he will do what he is going to do. And that fellow will pass an order, what's called an award, saying, okay, he will determine how much compensation should be given to you, and he will pass an award, and the land will be taken over, it will become government land. Okay, all your private land will become government land. Now, from the notification to the award, the time allowed is three years. You know, otherwise, it will lapse, the notification lapses. Now, what, supposing the Pata is title is very clear. What's your name? You? So let's say Lakshmi's title is clear, the land acquisition officer will give her her compensation. Nitya's title is clear, he will give her her compensation. What's your name? Huh? Let's say Divya and her sister are fighting. You know, her sister puts in a thing saying, no, no, even though the land belongs only to Divya, her sister deliberately to create trouble, she may put in a petition saying, no, no, I have a share in that land. So the land acquisition officer will say, I will simply deposit the money in the court. You both go and fight, you and your sister fight it out in the civil court. And that may take 10 years, 20 years, it may take longer. So whenever there is a title dispute, her title is not clear, the land acquisition officer simply deposits in the court. You understand my funda? Where the title is clear, the money is given. But even the money that is given is not adequate, it's a pittance. Where the title is not clear, the money is deposited in the court. Now in the case of tribals, there is very little, they didn't have pattas, proper titles. The land was usually communally owned, jointly owned. You know, either it was jointly owned or it was not, I mean, there was no record at all. It, in the revenue records, it might be shown as government land, whereas actually it was tribals were owning it. So the, either they were owning it jointly or there are no proper ownership records and individual ownership was rare. As a result, when the land was acquired, they didn't even get a pittance. Some of them didn't get money at all. Or even if the money, the land acquisition officer said, okay, all of you are owning it jointly, I don't know whose share is how much, you go fight it out in a court. So the money was deposited in a civil court and the civil court would take 10 years or 20 years. Okay. So as a result, tribals were suddenly dispossessed of their land and there was a lot of heartburn. And I remember reading an article once saying that from 1950 till date, whatever land has been acquired by government of India for various projects, 50% of it is tribal land. Now, as you know, tribals are only about 7% of the population. Even assuming they own about 7% of the land. Acquiring 50% of the land from one small section alone is unfair to that section. Of course, it may be that uh, wherever they are residing, most of the mineral deposits are there and uh, things are there. But tribals felt that they have been treated badly that the disproportionate share of their lands has been acquired under the Land Acquisition Act. So after around, initially of course they were quiet and they were uh, this one. After some time the resistance started building up. It started building up in two ways. One, you know, people like you know, Medha Patak and Aruna Roy and all these people, you know, they started lobbying saying this is not correct. I mean, you are, uh, unless you do, even World Bank started saying, unless you resettle and rehabilitate these people properly, unless you give them uh, proper compensation, you know, this is not, till 84, the compensation they were getting was pittance. After 84, the Land Acquisition Act was amended, the compensation was increased substantially, but still not enough, you know. And um, so, and as you know what happens, most of the time the land is acquired for industrial estates or something, and it's given to rich people. It's given to a company, it's given to Tata or uh, it's given to SR or Adani or something. So the tribals and the people felt this is a transfer of money from the poor to the rich. So after some time, so one section started lobbying through NGOs and others, another section took up arms. They said, no, we are not going to allow this. We are. So that's how all these district states became uh, Naxalite infected. You know? And my personal experience is in South, as I told you, the Naivali Lignite Corporation is there. And uh, you know, entire villages are acquired, you know. Supposing the Naivali Lignite Corporation says this village has got lignite deposit. Then land is acquired, the money is given, and people will not move out. You know, then uh, they, these fellows come to us as collector or whatever to evict those uh, villages. There will be usually a law and order problem, a riot and all that. Then you have to do taja to these fellows and say, please uh, go and all that. And you have to forcefully evict them 
and you know it is very uh, sad i mean it looks very sad okay when you acquire land for a road or something it is not that uh, painful because it is only a small part of the land people lo lose but when you ent acquire entire villages supposing 100 villages are gone that's what happens in a dam acquisition or you know mining acquisition then it's a very pa pathetic case so these people do have a genuine grievance you know that uh, and that's why you have all this Naxal affected area. wherever there is mining, coal mining is the major activity, other mining also, wherever there you find there is Naxal activity. Delays on the part of Coal India Limited in evacuating coal from pitheads to railway siding and then loading onto railway wagons. Over dependence on railways for coal transport, railways is plagued with problems of shortage of wagons, slow movement of trains, pilferage, variation in gauges long gestation periods for new railway projects etc basically it is like this supposing you have a mine there is a pit pitted means mine you know that's a mine proper near the mine near the pit there will be huge amount of coal that has been mined this has to be transported to the railway siding railway siding is nothing but a railway station you know, in the mine near the mine there will be a railway station you have to transport this there there will be another huge pile of mountain of coal in near the railway station. Now transporting from the pit to the railway station or railway siding is the job of the Coal India Limited. It will be quite some distance sometimes, you know. And then once it is loaded onto the railway, transporting to the various parts of India is the railway's job. Now there are a lot of delays on both sides. Coal India doesn't have enough, you know, evacuate, it's called evacuating equipment to transport from the pit to the railway siding and once it is loaded onto the railways, railways also have their own problems. You understand what I am saying? So I don't know how many of you have seen this movie Gangs of Vasepur, the Hindi movie. You know, you find some children stealing coal from the railway wagon. It's a usually an open wagon and people, there's a lot of people in India making a living of stealing <laughs> coal as it is being tra transported. So <coughs> in fact the irony here is on the one side you have power plants having one day stock, two day stock, seven day stock, living hand to mouth virtually, expecting uh, coal shipments to arrive. On the other hand you have huge coal, uh, you know, mined coal available in near the mine and in the railway station. You know, this whole thing is a lot of inefficiency in the system. And you know the problems of railways, shortage of wagons, they don't have enough wagons, slow movement of trains. All of us used to make fun of goods trains in our younger days. Then then pilferage, I told you the gangs of Vasepur story. Variation in gauges, you still have narrow gauge, you know, medium gauge and all that. Long gestation periods, a typical railway project takes years and years to fructify. So alternative modes of transport such as cross-country pipe conveyors, cable belt conveyors, coal transport in the form of slurry, harnessing of waterways need to be explored. I mean, explored, I don't think it's possible. Railway they will clear it. Okay, there's a coal mafia with the trade unions playing active part. Pilferage and sale of coal on the black market, inflated or fictitious supply expenses, falsified worker contracts, and expropriation and leasing out of government land, a significant fraction of the local population employed by the mafia in manually transporting the stolen coal. See, apart from coal India mining, there is a parallel black market in coal. Most of the time, with the connivance of the employees of coal India, managers, employer workers and all. They them and some local uh, dadas, politicians and all that. They are mining coal in the, in the black, unaccounted, and they are transporting it and they have private warehouses, you know. Recently in the, in the papers you must have read Meghalaya or Manipur, I don't know, some illegal coal mine. Some people got trapped and they were, it's an illegal coal mine. So like that there are plenty of illegal coal mines and they're all operated by the coal mafia. If you get into the IAS and you have the bad luck to be allotted to BR and have Jharkhand, whatever, and bad luck to be posted as collector of Dhanbad, then you are at risk of the coal mafia. They may, if you try to curb them, then you will be taking headlong and the coal mafia headlong, head on. You know. Delays in getting clearances. Coal sector is regulated at several levels with the central government 
See, I told you the last time about major minerals and minor minerals. Minor minerals are with the state government, major minerals are with central government. Minor minerals means only sand, clay, granite and all that. All, almost everything else is major minerals, they are with state, uh, central government. But to acquire the land, you know, you need to either land acquisition has to be done. Land, as you know, is a state subject. So st then you have to depend on the state government to acquire the land. Or you need lease of the land, again you have to come to the state government. So this is a subject which deals, which uh, you know, impacts upon both center and the state. Both uh, governments are involved. Plus you have environmental clearance, forest clearance, so many other clearances, you know. So there are umpteen clearances and this delays a project. Even in a simple, even in any government project, road project, water supply project, it is these clearances which take the maximum time. I remember I was implementing this Hoganical water supply project and it was passing through forest and all that. And knowing that it is the clearances which take maximum time, I was reviewing clearances intensively, you know, and I found there were some 350 clearances were needed in that project. And we kept on reviewing and in a period of six months or one year, we got them all. Whereas if you don't review, it will take two years or five years or to get the most people, you know, so you have to delays in land acquisition, land lease, resettlement and rehabilitation, environment management increase in. As I told you in the Naivali case and other cases, you can't simply throw people out, you have to resettle them. The resettlement will take some time, it will cost, but it has to be done. Otherwise, you will have an accelerated problem and other problem and it's also unfair, you know. What happened? Can you call somebody? Which button? Either. Okay, so now we, we, I'll move on to the, the next one. See, there are two types of this, one more terminology, that is induce coal mining and conventional coal mining. No. No, but the poor channel. So in induced coal mining, Supposing you are running a power plant, you are running a iron and steel plant or a fertilizer plant, you tell Okay, you tell so what happened is many of these people, I told you about coal India efficiency, India's inefficiency. So all these companies represented the government of India. They said, look, if we depend on coal India, we are not going to operate properly. So why don't you give us some coal beds directly? You allot some coal beds directly to us. We will mine the coal and we will use it for our industry. This is called captive mining. That is whatever coal you mine, you can use only for your industry. You can't sell it outside. You understand the point? Whereas conventional coal mining means you give it to a private party as we saw it in the case of oil. You call for tender, allot, you allot, find a coal block, put it to tender. You put it to tender and, yeah, thank you. So, induced coal mining versus commercial coal mining. In commercial coal mining, as in the case of oil, you put it for tender to private and international companies. And if they succeed in discovering the coal, they can sell it to anybody they like. You understand? So, that is the difference between induced and commercial coal mining. Okay. Now, here is an important a little bit of history. The coal mines which are previously privately owned or operated were nationalized by the Government of India by the Coking Coal Mines Nationalization Act 1972 and the Coal Mines Nationalization Act 1973. Coal India Limited became the deemed lessee of the concerned state governments in relation to all the nationalized coal mines. So Indira Gandhi nationalized the coal industry 1972-73. 
first she nationalized the coking coal mines and then she nationalized the other coal mines okay and those private fellows had some land leases all those became the leases of coal india you know because it was nationalized amendments to coal mines nationalization act 1973 were made to facilitate captive mining in approved endeavors industries such as power steel cement according to that only coal india and singareni collieries can mine coal so they brought in an amendment sometime in 1993 or something by which all these captive endeavors industries you know if you are running a power plant you are running a, they were also given coal blocks now now we are going to and this is stuck now not in Okay, now you heard of this coal scam, right? In the UPA government, the coal. I don't know if you really understood what that scam meant. Basically, it was relating to captive mines. As I told you, because of Coal India's inefficiency, a lot of industries, the representative government of India, saying we are not able to function properly. Third one, meeting the bar, change one meeting. The representative government of India saying we are not able to. the system okay fine so a lot of companies said we are not able to mine coal why don't you give us for captive purpose you know we will use it only in our own industries now government of india started giving between from 93 to 2011 they gave about 204 such licenses for uh, captive coal mining now the the complaint was number one they didn't put it to auction they just allotted you know number two if somebody asked for a lot of uh, area they simply gave there, there is no application of mind and there was favoritism and things like that that is the complaint then in fact it said that far more land was given to these fellows than they could have if all that if they had mined coal in all of that the coal production would have been more than the entire world production you know that much of land was given to these captive mining allotees and fellows who didn't have iron and steel plant or uh, in other power plant or something they were also given coal there is one minister i don't want to mention his name he runs hotels and uh, colleges he also got a coal plant allotted i didn't know at that point of time otherwise i had also applied and i would you know i would also got a coal plant so a lot of fellows thought okay even if we are not doing anything vaangi vechukomae namakku enna hai na so See, see, you may be good at running a power plant, or you may be good at running an iron and steel plant. That doesn't necessarily make you a good, uh, good at mining, because that's a different ball game altogether. So, and you have to deal with this coal mafia and so many problems, you know. So, first of all, this endeavors allotment itself was a bad idea, as they did in the case of uh, it is like you know in the oil sector, giving companies some oil fields, saying, okay, you go and explore, you know, that's a very foolish way. The correct way to do it is to commercial mining. you go for auction allow private players and foreign players to come in and increase the total production of coal and then ask them to sell you know that would have been the right thing imagine in the oil sector if they had done something like this this endeavors fund if they had applied in the oil sector it would have been foolish but they applied it in the coal sector so they committed three or four i'll read out here based on a public interest litigation in 2014 the supreme court of india cancelled 204 coal blocks earmarked for government and private companies for captive use since 1993 declaring these allotments illegal and arbitrary the allotments for captive mining had been made without following the procedure of public auction there was no auction as in the case of oil they simply allotted there is a committee screening committee or something and if x applies they look at his application they'll say okay give him if y applies and y is not influential or something they didn't give to why in several cases the blocks allotted were far in excess of need i told you that the total uh, land allotted 
If it had been put to use, the coal production would have been more than the world production. You know? And the existence of an end use plant or the required financial capability were not properly verified. The PIL was filed based on a CAG audit report that the allotments had caused a notional loss of rupees 1.86 lakh crores to the public exchequer. The matter was referred to CBI. You remember one IC, IAS officer called H.C. Gupta, who was Secretary Cole. He was convicted recently, you know, two, three years. He was supposed to be honest, but he signed the file. He was sitting on the screening committee. He made all allotments. So then uh, CBI and others said that company doesn't even have uh, a proper end use thing. How did you allot to him? Uh, of course, the company had bluffed and these guys had not verified. You know? Their point is we can't sit here and verify everything. But then you must devise some system. You must have some inspection team or whatever, you know. So, but CAG, how CAG arrived at this 1.86 lakh crores, nobody knows. When there is no bid, on what basis he arrived at it, nobody knows. He simply arrived at some figure. But that figure, as you know, caught the, just as in the 2G scam, 1.76 lakh crores. Here, the 1.86 lakh crores, it caught the imagination of the nation. And I think it led to a change of government also. You know, so I'll come to the point later how the CAG's, uh, the CAG's figure doesn't seem to be correct. You know? Now, because the Supreme Court struck down all those end use allotments, captive mining allotments, the present government, they brought in the Coal Mines Special Provisions Act 2015, which introduced a transparent procedure for coal block auctions and allocations. What they did in oil in 97, they are doing it in coal in 2015. They wasted 18 years. They should have done this all in 97 itself. They should have done the same thing for coal also. They didn't do it because, as I told you, of the coal mafia. A lot of Western interests were there. Maybe many politicians were also interested. So they won't let coal be put to auction the way oil was put to auction. Because oil extraction is difficult. You need a lot of investment technology. Coal, anybody can extract. That's why you understand the difference why it took 18 years for the coal to be put to open auction. You know? so in case of government companies or its uh, uh, joint venture, the allotment may be made without auction. Nominated authority shall be appointed for conduct of auction or allotment. The proceeds of auction shall be received by the nominated authority and dispersed to respective states. So as I told you, 204 allotments had been made. Now Supreme Court, I think, went a little overboard. They cancelled even the allotments made to state governments and public sector undertaking. For example, Tamil Nadu government under the old system, Tamil Nadu government, Tamil Nadu Electricity Board or Gujarat government, Gujarat Electricity Board, they all also had coal allotments. Tamil Nadu government had some coal block in Orissa, some in Jharkhand and things like that. You know. Supreme Court cancelled everything and said, no, you start again. Of course, then uh, when the government brought in this 2015 act, government said no. Unlike in ONGC where they said, in the oil blocks, they said ONGC will participate on a level field with uh, this one. Here they said no. The PSUs will get allotments. The private companies only auction. There's a slight difference between the two because you have to produce coal on a day-to-day -day basis. Power plants are dependent and so many industries are dependent. You can't, auctions and all can take a long time. And you know, if the price goes up, the cost of electricity can also go up. For so various reasons, government said no. For public sector undertakings and state governments will continue to allot without auction. But for private entities, it will be auction. You understand the slight difference between oil and here? But only 89 of the 204 captive mining blocks cancelled by the Supreme Court have been reallocated so far. 58 directly allotted to state governments or PSUs, 31 to out of the 204 fellows, when auction was conducted, only 89 blocks were taken, which shows the remaining 115, the people had got it just for you know? They were not really serious about it. They kept it only because they had got it. Not really free, but they had got it easily. They didn't realize the value of it. And many of them had got it and they were not exploiting it also. You know, they were just keeping it idle. So when actually it was put to tender, uh, to auction. Auction tests whether you are serious or not because you have to pay some money and uh, you know you test your seriousness. And when you, we found that only 89 people are serious. The others are not serious. Even among these 89, only about 28 are producing coal today. And 8 may become operational by March 2019. The rest are bogged down by various problems. You know? While there was aggressive bidding for the blocks initially, there has been no response for the remaining 115 blocks. So Supreme Court thought, and Government of India also thought, that all these 204 will be taken. But only 89 were taken 
150, no response at all. Only a sum of rupees 5,684 crores has been collected by coal auctions and allotments during the three and a half years period from February 2016 as against an expectation of rupees 2 lakh crores before the auction, a mere 3%. The loss to the public exchequer made by CAG audit was clearly exaggerated. If CAG had said loss is 6,000 crores, it may not have created so much of sensation. The CAG boosted the figure and put as 1.86 lakh crores. Nobody knows how he got that figure, but he put the figure like that. And actually, when you conducted the auction, the figure, you, the amount you got was only about 6,000 crores, which is only 3%. Okay. Early this year, the present government took a major step. The two nationalized acts were repealed. Nationalization acts were repealed on 8th January 2018. In the final step towards denationalization, on 20th February, Government of India permitted private firms to do commercial coal mining. You remember I told you, induced coal mining and commercial coal mining, induced is for only that particular company and they can't sell it outside. Commercial coal mining means you, like Coal India, you also mine and you can sell it to anybody. Government of India should have gone for commercial coal mining when it went for that um, NEPL in oil. At the same time, in the late 90s, they should have gone for commercial coal mining, but they didn't do it. They have done it now, after nearly 20 years delay. The move breaks the monopoly over commercial mining that Coal India Limited has enjoyed since nationalization. It's effective to bring efficiency to the coal sector. Hitherto, private investors were only permitted captive coal mining for mandatory own usage in industries like power, steel, cement and aluminum. Such investors may not necessarily have expertise in mining. Under the new policy, the induced restriction clause will be removed and the successful bidder will be permitted full production and supply freedom, including merchant sale of production. Only companies with proven expertise in commercial mining, many of them international players, are likely to participate in the auctions for commercial mining. A regulator for the... You understood this point? Now, they have put it for open auction. Coal India also will have to compete along with them, you know, and uh, hopefully foreign players with good technology will come in. Now, you may ask the question, okay, a foreign player with good technology may come in, but how will that coal be transported? If you are again going to depend upon Indian railways and, uh, you know, so how, how is it going to be transported? So for that, you will have to permit them maybe to lay their own railway lines. You know, it's not easy. I mean, just because you have solved one side of the problem, it doesn't mean that the whole problem is solved. There are many other downstream problems also. A regulator for the coal sector is on the cards. The regulator will arbitrate in disputes between the state and the miners, as well as between rival miners, and may look into complaints of mispricing. As long as only government or a public sector is producing, you don't need a regulator. You remember in the telecommunication sector, you have TRI, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. The moment you have multiple private fellows and you have government uh, and PSU also, or one or more PSUs, there may be disputes between the private fellows or between a PSU and a private fellow or between all of them and the government. So then you, and there is a need for a regulator. So every sector which has multiple private players, will need a regulator. So coal also, the moment you open it to private people, you will need a regulator. As long as it was induced mining, there is no need for regulator because he was only using it for his use. But now commercial mining, you need a regulator. Government of India hopes to auction about 20 large-sized coal blocks for commercial mining by private miners by March 2019. They put about 20 blocks for auction. Okay, now I'll quickly summarize. Just listen to me carefully. I am saying that lignite is an inferior form of coal, geologically younger, found closer to the surface, easy to mine, but has certain defects, low heat content, you know, highly polluting. Then steaming coal versus coking coal, I told you the difference between the two, and I told you that India has coal reserves lasting 400 years. And I told you that our imports, coal imports are, ideally we should be importing only coking coal if at all. But we are also importing a lot of steaming coal because Coal India and Singarani Coalias are utterly inefficient. And I told you that both our domestic coking coal and domestic steaming coal are poor stuff. Domestic coking coal imports we can understand. Steaming coal we shouldn't be ideally importing at all. I told you what are the problems near monopoly. Most of the power plants are idling or 
if they are operating at suboptimal levels, the new plants are not coming up or if they come up, they have to depend on imports. Few states, transportation cost high, outdated technology, next level, next level problem, delays in transporting from the mine to the railway station, then delays in the part of the railways to transport, coal mafia, delays in getting clearances, delays in land equation, all these are the problems. I also told you what is end-use coal mining and commercial coal mining, and I told you that coal which was previously in the private sector was nationalized by Indira Gandhi, and then sometime in 93, they allowed captive mining for various user industries, but this captive mining allotments were made indiscriminately, you know, far beyond need, without verifying uh, the capabilities and uh, needs and all that. Some 204 allot coal blocks were given, there's a public interest litigation, Supreme Court cancelled all of them and CAG said 1.86 lakhs to 2 lakh crores will come if you auction. Then government, the present government brought in this Coal Mine Special Provisions Act 2015 um, for a transparent auction procedure, similar to what is there in you know, NELP in the oil sector. But when they auctioned, they found that only 89 out of the 204 were taken, the others were not taken and only about 6,000 crores money they got, not 1.86 lakhs or 2 lakhs, only about 3% they got. And the last step is they have now completely, they repealed those two nationalization acts of Indira Gandhi. They are now allowed commercial mining. They have put 20 blocks to auction, but as I said, it's not enough. Why? The problems are not only with the, okay, now because the foreign player has come, they may ex extract, uh, you know, mine a lot of coal, there may not be any delays between the pit head and the railway station. Up to that is fine. Then what happens after that? If they are also going to depend on the Indian railways, things are not going to improve. So we are not sure how many bidders takers will be there. Let us see. You just what this space has to say. You know, by March 2019, we'll know whether this has been successful. I hope you are clear about coal. Okay, good. Now we'll go to the last and the most important sector, which is power. India is the world's third largest producer and the third largest consumer of electricity despite lower electricity tariff. Tariff is a term for rates. Basically, it means prices, price. The per capita electricity consumption in India is 1,149 kilowatt hours, which is below the world average of 2,674 kilowatt hours per capita. You don't have to remember the figure. What you must remember is because India is a poor country or a less developed country, the per capita electricity consumption in India is very less. Even though the tariff, the price of electricity is very cheap, is very less, the electricity is cheap, price is very less, the per capita consumption in India is less. Compared to world, we are in the bottom half of the world average. The world average is 2674, ours is only 1149. You can see we are way below, you know. So you don't have to remember that 1149 and 2674, but you must remember this funda that though electricity is cheap in India, still our per capita consumption is very low, lower than even the global average. Residential consumption, industrial consumption, agricultural consumption, commercial consumption, the ratio is 24% is to 41% is to 18% is to 5.5%. Now, for agricultural consumption in most states, it's either free or highly subsidized. Residential consumption, consumption is not free, but highly subsidized because people will protest. So the cross subsidy comes from industrial consumption and commercial consumption. So you find that industrial 41 plus commercial 5, about together they are about 47 percent. They cross subsidize agriculture 24.2 and uh, sorry residential 24.2 agriculture 18, 42. So the 47 percent is cross subsidizing the 42 percent. Due to rapid economic growth, India is one of the fastest growing energy markets in the world. It, given India's limited oil and gas reserves, it has ambitious plans to expand its renewable energy and nuclear energy program. India has five nuclear reactors under construction and plans 18 more by 2025. So I told you already that India's oil and gas deposits are going to last only for another 20 years and 30 years at current consumption levels. As we expand, that period is going to be much shorter. So we really have a serious problem. Of course, we can exploit coal bed methane that is one. We also, but our gas pipeline is very poor. We have not done enough of gas pipeline thing. And we have been pretty slow in 
rationalizing our policies. So we really have. So government of India is going to give a big fillip to renewable energy, wind and solar energy, and to nuclear. But nuclear has got a problem, as you all know. Number one, it's a long gestation. It takes 10, 12 years you know, to put up a nuclear plant. Long, long time. Number two, there's a perception that it is not safe. Though governments keep assuring us that it's safe, because of the Fukushima disaster in Japan, the Three Mile Island disaster in USA, the Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine, people say even in those advanced countries there have been disasters. What's the guarantee there won't be a disaster in India? You know? And there is also the problem of nuclear waste. It's highly radioactive. Where are you going to worry? Where are you going to bury it? So all these problems are there. Putting up a nuclear plant is not easy. There is going to be public resistance, agitations, and even getting the supply is a problem for India because we have not signed the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. So our only hope then that means is renewable energy, you know, and coal-based energy. I mean. Electrical power activities can be broadly divided into three categories, generation, transmission, and distribution. I suppose this part is clear. You have a power plant, which is the generation. Then you have these transmission lines. You would have seen them, you know, tall structures carrying. They are the, that is transmission. And distribution is within a city or a village or whatever. That is distribution. Electric power industry is different from other industries. Electricity cannot be stored. One has to generate electricity instantaneously to meet end users, customers' demands. Electrical power demand is fluctuating. It is difficult to predict demand with 100% accuracy based on past data. How many of you here are electrical engineers? Please raise your hands. Nobody? She's not raising her hand. Huh? <laughs> She's afraid that I'll ask some question on electrical engineering. Huh? So, electrical engineering, see all industries, See, in other industries like steel or coal or whatever, oil, what you produce, you can store and you can sell it tomorrow. You can sell it uh, two years, one year from now. Some are perishable, some are not perishable. If it is perishable, you may have to sell it fast before the perish. If it is non-perishable, you can keep it longer and sell it. But electricity has the problem that it is instantaneous. As soon as it is produced, you have to use it. You may say, what about batteries? Yes, a small amount of electricity can be stored in batteries, but there is battery technology is still primitive, you know, it's very primitive, so you can, for all practical purposes, you can ignore the funda that electricity can be stored. For all practical purposes, electricity cannot be stored, and electrical, so, which means, depending on the demand, you have to produce. You can't produce and uh, leave it, because if you produce too much, then the lines will get burnt down, and, or the, there may be problem. If you produce too less also, there will be a blackout and load, you know, so you have, you have to match it correctly, you know, that balancing pro power production supply and demand is critical to electricity industry. Base load versus peak load. Load is the amount of power in the electrical grid. Base load is the level that it typically does not go below. That is the basic amount of electricity that is always required. Peak load is the daily fluctuation of electricity use. It's usually lowest in the wee hours of the morning and highest in the early evening. I'll give you the example of transport. Say during office time, school time and all that, you need more buses, more tra suburban trains, there will be peak rush hour traffic. Maybe in the middle of the day, there may not be so much traffic. Evening, again, when the office uh, schools are over, office times are over, there will be a lot of traffic. You know, night, there may not be much traffic. In order to stagger the traffic, many schools and colleges, they start early uh, so that they don't clash with the office going times, you know, so that you, the transport demand is staggered, understand? So now you can understand the same fund of peak load and uh, base load you can understand. You need a minimum amount of buses and trains to commute for a commuter citizen, but during peak hours you also need more buses and train services. This applies even across beyond a day. For example, during festival seasons you may need both more buses and more trains, you know, special trains may be needed for festival seasons or whatever, you know. So, this is what, the so same funda applies in electrical thing. You need a base load, you know, which is going to be constant, and then you have a fluctuating load. You have, you know, sometimes there may be more in the evening, more during office hours, less in the night, and things like this. Now, these statistics, you can have a look at it. Some of them are important to remember, some you need not. Out of the total installed capacity in India is 346 gig gigawatts. It's as of today, it will keep improving. 
what are the state governments contribute to 24%, central government 30%, private sector 45%. This you can remember. State is 24, center 30, private is 45%. What does this show? The private sector is contributing 45% of the power produced. That means private participation in the generation sector is quite high. You know. Installed capacity by type of energy. There it was by ownership. Here we are talking of type of energy. Thermal is 64%, hydroelectric is 13%, nuclear is 2%, renewable energy is 21%. This also you should remember. Therm renewable energy 21% you should remember, nuclear 2% you should remember, hydro 13%. The rest is thermal which is 64%. Out of thermal, coal is the important 47 then gas, then oil. Okay, so this 346, basically the, what it shows here is, Nuclear is only 2%, we have a long, long way to go. Renewable energy is 72 gigawatts, 72,000 megawatts, 72 gigawatts, that's about 21%. Energy deficit and peak power deficit. As I told you, energy deficit is how much energy we are producing in a year and whether that is enough for the demand, that's a deficit. Peak deficit, even if you are producing enough energy, you know, sometimes there may, you may not be producing, during the peak hours you, there may be, you may not be producing enough. So in India in 2009-10, energy deficit was 10 percent, peak power deficit was 12 percent. And in 2017-18, energy deficit was 7.7 percent, .7%, peak power deficit is 2 percent. That is, you understand the difference between peak power, that is, even if you have sufficient energy, you may still not be able to meet the peak power. Now if you produce enough energy capacity for peak power, then most of the time it will be idle. So you don't always produce enough for the peak power, you produce something a little below. Okay, this is just to show that how the energy has been increasing. You don't have to remember this. This is to show the growth rate. It's about 4 to 6 percent, 4 to 8 percent has been growing. Okay, now we come to an important for the plant load factor. Now, who is the lady who wanted, refused to be identified? Uh, so, what is the plant load factor? Okay, let me tell you what plant load factor is. It is average not average, actual divided by maximum. Actual power that a power plant produces divided by maximum power that it can produce. Let me give an individual example. What's your name? Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel. Let's say Emmanuel is damn good at maths. You know? He thinks he can score 100 out of 100 in this. But actually when he went to the examination, Emmanuel did some silly mistakes or you know, he got only 90 out of 100. So Emmanuel's plant load factor, I mean to use the rough thing is about 90%. His actual is 90, his maximum could have been 100, he only did 90. So similarly, a power plant's installed capacity may be, let's say X, but it's actual X, uh, this one, gigawatts or something, but uh, megawatts, but it's not actually going to produce that much. It will only produce some percentage of lower. Why? Because the demand fluctuates considerably. You are not going to have 100, I mean, uh, continuous high demand. Demand fluctuates considerably, so you will never produce. You will rarely have a PL of approaching 100. So plant load factor is the ratio between the actual energy generated by the plant to the maximum possible energy that can be generated with the plant working at its rated power and for a duration of an entire year. A higher PL of is better. PL is affected by non-availability of fuel, Maintenance shutdown, unplanned breakdown, fluctuation of consumption, offtake lowered. I told you, if coal India doesn't supply fuel and you have to shut down your plant because you non-supply fuel, obviously your plant load factory is going to come down. Supposing your plant has a breakdown, then again power generated will be lost during that period. Or preventive maintenance, you may shut down for one month or 15 days or one week. That time also you are not going to produce power. So for various reasons, but the most important reason is fluctuation in demand. Demand is going to fluctuate throughout the day and throughout the year. So you are not going to be ever operating at 100% capacity. Capacity is the wrong word, I mean 100% PLF. You know. In 2017-18, overall PLF in India for coal and lignite based power generation was only 60%. Look at that. Even though we have an installed capacity of so much, only 60, plant load factor, actual the thing is, you say it is only 60%. In that central power stations did better, 72%, states 57%, private 
even worse, 55 percent. It's not because they are doing badly, but maybe because, you know, the electricity boards may not have been purchasing from them properly, you know. They might be last, I mean, first they will buy from a central or state, then they will buy from the private. The private fellows rate also may be more, so they may be buying less from them, which means they are not using their plants fully, you know. Now, this is the interesting part. Renewable energy sources, solar and wind, have PLF of only 15 to 20 percent, which means a 50 megawatt solar plant generates consumable power equivalent to only about 10 or 12 megawatts. You understand why, why is it so low? You don't know when wind will blow. Wind will blow only a few times in a day. Sun doesn't shine throughout the day. So the PLF of is not even 50 percent, it's only 15 to 20 percent. So though we may say here that the installed capacity of renewable energy is 72 gigawatts, the actual use will be only about 15 percent to 20 percent of that. You understand what I'm saying? So in the renewable energy, you need much more. You have to install a lot of capacity to get some usable power. In GOI, sorry, in 2015, Government of India revised the target for renewable energy as 175 gigawatts by 2022, of which 100 gigawatts would be from solar. As you know, in 2017, it was 72. Government of India wants to increase it from 72 gigawatts to 175 gigawatts, out of which 100 would be solar. I mean, no harm in planning, but whether we'll be able to achieve it or not is a different question. And Government of India has set a target of 40 percent of the total energy consumption from RE sources by 2030. Because our coal and oil reserves are running out, Government of India is thinking by 2030, 40 percent should be renewable energy. We should consume from only from renewable energy sources. The only way this problem can be solved is by improved battery technology. You know, whoever comes up with a good battery that can store solar energy or wind energy and, you know, without much loss, he is going to get a is going to make a billion. So if some of you have got a brilliant idea, drop this IAS preparation, go and invent a good battery. Okay. In 2016-17, for the first time, the capacity addition by RE exceeded that by conventional energy sources. Tariff of RE is today comparable to that of energy from conventional energy sources. This is a very important paragraph. What it means is, all these years, whatever capacity addition we have been doing in energy sector, wherein coal and lignite based power plants, you know, thermal, mostly thermal, sometimes hydro, mostly thermal. For the first time in 2016-17, the capacity addition by renewable energy, that is wind and solar, was more than capacity addition by thermal. You understand what I'm saying? By lignite and coal. What does this show? That is, renewable energy is now getting a solid boost. Tariff of RE is uh, today comparable to that of energy from conventional energy sources. One problem with renewable energy, wind and solar energy, apart from its unpredictability and low plant load factor was, tariff was very high. The one unit used to cost 15 rupees, 16 rupees, 20 rupees before. It has come down. It came down to 10, 8. Now it has, the, whereas coal and lignite, the tariff, the cost of production price used to be about 2 to 2 and a half rupees to 3 rupees. Now this has also come below. 3 rupees, which on renewable energy, solar and wind cost per unit also come below 3 rupees. So this is an important paragraph, I want you to remember it. For the first time, capacity addition by RE exceeded that by conventional energy sources. Tariff of RE is today comparable to that of energy from this one. Okay, renewable purchase obligation. Now, Government of India, as I told you, wants everybody to depend on renewable energy for 40 percent of their energy needs. Now, by merely preaching, it's not going to happen. You have to compel people to go for renewable energy. So, for that, Government of India has come out with what's called Renewable Purchase Obligation, or RPOs. RPOs make it compulsory for all large consumers of energy to ensure that a certain percentage of that energy mix is from renewable sources such as wind and solar. The compulsion is like an implicit subsidy boost to the renewable sector. It generates demand for a sector in its infancy. RPO is 17% of the total energy demand for FY in 2018-19 and will go up to 21% for FY 2021-22. But as RE has low PLF, this means reduced overall PLF and greater inefficiency. Basically what it means is, as of today, if Ashok Leyland wants to consume power, 17% they have to do it from wind and solar. Remaining 83% they can do from coal and lignite. And this is increasing year by year. By 2021-22, the RPO is 
21 percent. That means 21 percent of your power you have to consume only from wind and solar. By doing this, Government of India is <coughs> ensuring that people who are putting up RE plants will have a market. Otherwise, you know, there are no takers. I may put up a uh, wind plant at great expense or a solar plant at great expense. If there are no buyers, then what's the use? Now, no buyers are going to be there because, as I told you, the tariff has come down. The cost of uh, renewable energy has become comparable to that of coal and this one. So, there is, uh, so these people can't crib. The only thing they can crib about is RES low PLF, you know. Of course, but they are going to use only, pay for only what they are actually using. Not every state has adequate RE power available to be purchased. Renewable energy certificate, RECs, are market of tradable certificates that have to be purchased by obligated entities in lieu of RPOs. Into. I want you to do the, because the time is running out, I want you to do the, uh, read up this on your own. I hope you are aware of this carbon trading permits. If you are a polluting industry, you know, then either you stop the pollution or you buy a carbon trading permit from a non-polluting industry. A non, if you are a non-polluting industry, you will be given some carbon trading permits. That and that fellow will make money because he has spent some, let's say I am a non-polluting industry. I spent a lot of money and made my industry non-polluting. She is a polluting industry. Sorry, don't mistake me. Eh? <laughs> so, so she is a polluting industry. So she has not spent the money. So the compulsion is, okay, if you are not putting up effluent treatment plant and other things, at least you buy the carbon trading permit so that she is not put, otherwise you know, I can't compete on an equal footing with her. My cost is more by cheating on the pollution treatment, she is having this one. So the compulsion is either you put it up yourself or you buy a, so same fund here, either you put up a, you buy renewable energy or you buy a renewable energy certificate. Because in some states there is not enough renewable energy. Those guys have to necessarily buy only renewable energy certificate, okay. And national power grid, this is another important funda. Again, this is a case where government of India delayed by almost 20, 30 years. Now, what is the power grid? You remember we talked about national gas grid. We need a, you know, see each state is a unit for electricity power. Within the state, you have always, you had a state grid even in the 1950s. You know, even though the power may be produced in two, three power plants, but we had a state grid. In 1960s, government of India formed five regional grids, southern grid, western grid, northern grid, Eastern grid, northeastern grid. You know, southern grid would be, uh, I mean, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala. These are all southern grid. So, if there is surplus power in one state and deficit in another state, the deficit state can buy the power from the surplus state. But to buy power, you need transmission lines. You understand? Uh, basically, if I am, my transmission lines must be connected. Karnataka transmission lines must be connected to Tamil Nadu transmission lines and Andhra transmission lines so that they are, that's what is meant by grid. So, the, I should be able to buy power from the Karnataka or whatever, or vice versa. So, then what happened? Government felt that these regional grids are not sufficient. We must have national grid. Understand? So, all those regional grids were interconnected. And finally, the last grid to be connected was the southern grid. It is connected only in 2013. So, from 2013, we are a national grid. I will read, read fast. There is regional imbalance in terms of power generation capacity and power demand. A power grid transfers power from the surplus regions to the deficit ones and helps manage the peak deficit problems by removing the transmission constraints. India began using grid management on a regional basis in the 1960s. Individual state grids were interconnected to form five regional grids, northern, eastern, western, northeastern and south, southern grids. In the 1990s, the Indian government began planning for a national grid. In October 1991, the northeastern and eastern grids were interconnected. The western grid was connected in March 2003, northern grid in August 2006, southern grid in 2013. Provides relief to the traditionally power short southern region. Buying power from the national grid costs only about one third. You remember I told you that one side power plants didn't have enough coal. You know, they were operating hand to mouth. One day coal, three days coal, seven days coal. Another side, we had huge coal reserves in coal, uh, mined coal piles in at the pits and at the railway stations. It was utter incompetence. You know, this was. similarly, we had some states where there was surplus power, and we had some states where there was load shedding for you know 10 hours power cut, 13 hours power cut. Traditionally, the southern states had 
lot of power cuts, you know. And southern states were also the developed states. They didn't have coal, but they had a lot of industry, so they needed more power. Whereas the states which had coal were all the backward states, and they had more coal, they had more power. So, but how do you, you supposing Jharkhand has more power, how will, how can Tamil Nadu buy from Jharkhand unless there is a grid? If there is a connection, if all the grids, all the, you know, states were connected, by a national grid. Then you can, Tamil Nadu can buy from Jharkhand, Tamil Nadu can buy from Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu can buy from Odisha or whoever it is. But if you don't have a grid, if each of them is like a separate island, you know, a grid is basically like a bridge. You know, you can imagine five bridge, five islands, they are all been joined together by a bridge. So now, if you remember, those of you who are in Tamil Nadu, there used to be a lot of power cuts till 2013. From between 2006 and 2013, there are a lot of power cuts. After 2013, there are no power cuts, not because Tamil Nadu's government has put up more power plants, not because of that, but because of the national grid. Tamil Nadu government is now in a position to buy power from some surplus state. You understand what I'm saying? Tamil Nadu government is in a... Now, it is not OC, it's not given free, you have to buy. Now, if Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu government is uh, put up its own plant, it may cost about 3 unit, three rupees per unit or 2 and a half rupees per unit. But when you buy on the, from the national grid, it may be more. I'm just saying hypothetically, it may be 5 rupees per unit. But Tamil Nadu government may say, okay, better to who will put up a plant, it's a nuisance to put up and run it and all that. Let me buy from the national grid. The alternative is running a generator, and that costs rupees 20 per unit. No, in the, in the past in Tamil Nadu, whenever there was a load shed, all these industries used to run big generators. And that used to be very costly. It used to cost about 20 rupees per unit of power. But thanks to the national grid, now Tamil Nadu government is buying power from surplus states. And so, maybe it's buying at 5 rupees, maybe if it had produced itself, it would be only 2 and a half rupees. But the national government is, uh, grid is a damn good thing. In fact, I feel that it should have come at least 30 years sooner. You know, it should have come in the 1960s or 70s. Aggregate transmission and commercial losses, ATC losses. Basically, you know, there are two types of losses, technical losses and commercial losses. Technical losses is when power is transmitted. In the case of water, you know, there's a loss of head, you say. When you transmit water from a zone, there's a lot of loss of pressure, loss of head. Similarly, in electricity, some of the electricity is lost by way of heat, heat and other things because of the resistance of the conductor. And so, that is a technical loss. That can't be helped, you know, the technical loss. But there is also a commercial loss because people steal power. No, if you see a public meeting, political party meeting, you think those guys are taking money and they're paying for it, they just put a cookie and conduct the meeting and then they go off. So that is called theft. And a lot of people, you know, there's a meter, many people didn't have meters in their houses, you know, many people. And even if they meter, there are a lot of fellows who tamper the meters and make it run slowly. The, the way you're nodding the head, it looks like you have experience in this matter. <laughs> huh? So, or they bribe the electricity fellow, board fellow, and say, Kunjai, the slow power of a and all that, you know. So, so that is on a tamper, faulty meters, tampered meters, no meters, power theft, these are all some of the common. So, in Tamil Nadu, for example, farm power is free. But many people from a farm connection, they will take and they run an industry, or they will run the house. So, this, these are ways and ways of cheating, you know. So, basically, India has 21.5%, 21.35% of ATC losses. My own feeling is they are understating it, it's 30% or something. But developed countries, Germany, for example, is only about 7%. And most of the developed countries have less than 10%. So, we are wasting so much of power. Number one, our PLF is low, 60%. Number two, our transmission and this one is, losses are high. So, if you... You will realize that we can, you know, save a lot of power. Rural and urban electrification, Deen Dayal Upadhyaya Gram Jyoti Yojana. Basically, the idea is to cover all the villages and all the towns. In April 2018, you might have read, Government of India proudly announced that all Indian villages have been electrified. And, but electrifying villages is one thing. In each village, there will be many houses. Have you electrified all the houses is the point. You might have electrified only the rich people's houses and the middle class people's houses. What about the poor people's houses? So, Government of India claims that 92% of the rural households have been electrified. I'm slightly skeptical about the figure. I think it's a bit high. And in urban areas, Government of India claims 97%. Now, I have a personal story to tell here. 
see, Tamil Nadu was the first state where all the panchayats were electrified way back in 1950s, during the time of Mr. K. Kamraj. Now, he pursued aggressively the goal of electrifying all the village panchayats in Tamil Nadu. There, is, there are 12,600 village panchayats in Tamil Nadu, and the report was that all of them had been electrified. The rest of the states woke up much later. In fact, in Vajpayee's first government, the NDA government, there was a scheme called Bharat Nirman. One of the components was electrification of all the villages. You know, Even before that, they were doing it, but they were doing it a little slowly. You know? And in management, there's a funda, Peter Drucker's famous funda. You know, It says, what gets monitored gets done. If something is monitored, then it will get done. If something is not monitored, it won't get done. If your father is monitoring you to see whether you're reading, or if Israel and his people are monitoring whether you're reading, then you'll read. If they let you go, then you'll freak out. You know? So this is nature, basic human tendency. Only what is monitored gets done. Now, I was collector in Vilupuram in 1993. I went there in 93. It's a very backward district. Once I was going to a village, I, they said no power. And I thought, you know, the, no power means there's a power cut. They said, no, sir, no power at all. I said, how the hell can it be? I was told that way back in 1950s, during Kamraj time itself, there's no, uh, all the villages in Tamil Nadu have been electrified. Then I found that a typical village panchayat or a village is not one village. There will be a big village and there will be some hamlets, you know, Kugramangal, they say in Tamil. There will be hamlets surrounding it. So in Kamaraj period, what they had done was electrified all the main villages. But some of the Kugramangal or uh, hamlets were not electrified. They were, because of lack of monitoring, they were slowly electrified in the 60s, 70s, 80s. But as late as 1993, almost 35 years later, 25 years later, there were still, or 35 years later, sorry, there were still, in my district alone, there were some 467 villages which had not been electrified. Imagine, 1994, about 467 villages had not been electrified. Then I pulled, now I found in the government, you know, money is not a problem, contrary to what people say. Spending money is a problem, getting money is not a problem, you know. So I found a lot of unused money, which otherwise our fellows were swindled, Poi will put it through. So I took out that money from these buggers and put it into this one, just for this, electrifying these 467 hamlets. But then the electricity board, like Coal India, you know, they're also monopoly, they're very sluggish. They told me, sir, 467 and all, we can't do it, it'll take us four years. We need a lot of poles, thousands of poles. We need so many, so much length of conductors, so many transformers. It will take us at least three to four years. Then I came to the chairman of the city board in Madras. He was a senior IAS officer. I told him, sir, uh, your fellows are sluggish and they're not cooperating. He said, uh, what does it mean? And he picked up the phone, shouted at the SE. He said, I want it done in six months. The SE said, immediately when he said, the chairman said, the fellow said, okay, sir, and all that. You know? And the uh, same bugger finally did it in nine months. You know, he did it in nine months. So. Later, I became director of rural development in 96, and my jurisdiction is the whole state. So I told the minister, sir, uh, I was under the impression that uh, there are no villages yet to be covered. I found in Velupuram, the 467 uh, villages are there. So I'm sure this problem is there in other districts also. And so between 96 and 2001, we covered all the remaining hamlets. You know, all the remaining hamlets, we covered it. And in 2006, the DMK government came up with a scheme called Color TV, free color TV distribution. Maybe a silly scheme, but it had one tremendous benefit. And you know, the tremendous benefit was to give TV, the house must have a electricity connection. So it is not enough if you, you know, the village is electrified, you must make sure that every 100% of the houses are also electrified. And of course, the free gas, uh, you know, mixy and grinder also uh, did piggyback riding on that, you know. So between 2006 and 2011, I mean, I was Secretary of Rural Development at the time. I made sure that all the houses, in, you know, we are re reviewing electricity board and all that. We, are, we made sure that all the houses in Tamil Nadu were electrified. So that's what I'm saying. With so much difficulty, we made sure that 100% were electrified. I doubt the government of India has figured that 92% of the houses are electrified. May be correct, but I have my own doubts, you know. But in Andhra Pradesh, Goa, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Gujarat, Puducherry, Punjab, 100% of the rural households will be. In Tamil Nadu, I can assure you it is 100% because otherwise this free color TV, free mixy grinder and all would not have worked. I am not very sure about Andhra Pradesh, Goa and their figures. Okay. Now the Electricity Act 2003 is a very important thing. A question is likely on this. Now let me basically explain the funda to you, then I will read fast. <coughs> 
as i told you electricity has three components generation transmission and distribution now all three were in the electricity board they were all three under one unit called the state electricity board which was a monopoly now government of india felt first why should all three be under one thing let us unbundle them unbundle them means split make generation separate transmission separate and distribution separate generation at least can be done by private fellows any private fellow should be able to put up a power plant okay transmission is difficult for a private because transmission lines have already been laid you can't a private fellow cannot lay a parallel transmission line the only situation in which a private fellow can lay a parallel transmission line is supposing i am uh, adani or somebody i put up a new port and i need a uh, connection transmission line the regular electricity board may take a ages so i may say okay i'll put it up myself i'll spend the money and instead of giving you the money and asking you to do it i'll do it myself you know or as i told you one of those foreign players might take up a coal block in jharkhand they may say we'll put up our own transmission line we'll put up our own distribution line they may say that you know so so government of india said it makes sense that generation basically what we want is more power so let us unbundle all the three generation will be delicensed anybody even you and i can enter and put up a power plant except a nuclear plant and a hydroelectric plant we can put up any plant but transmission and distribution government of india said it's also open to the private but only on a license so if i want to put a if adani wants to put up a transmission plant directly to his port or somebody else wants to put up a transmission line directly to his coal field or whatever industry then he must get a license and then he can put it up you get the funda so generation was delicensed first thing it said is all three should be unbundled second okay you keep it in the public sector you want i mean but you must un i mean private generation you should allow then but for uh, transmission and distribution and also trading you know because when you once you have allow private sector then somebody has to buy the power from them so trading is also allowed for these three activities license was introduced transmission distribution and trading now supposing i am a private sector i have put up a power plant now ashok lalan wants to buy power from me now obviously ashok lalan and i both have to use the transmission line and the distribution line already put up by tamil nadu electricity board or whatever the public utility you understand follow me i am not going to put a separate transmission line it's not worth it so government of india brought in a policy called open access open access means tamil nadu electricity board can't say our transmission lines and distribution lines can be used only by it can, i mean it is thrown open to anybody if I, as long as i am willing to pay the charges whatever charges they say tamil nadu electricity board cannot refuse to make their transmission lines and distribution lines available to me otherwise the whole purpose of my putting a power plant in the private sector is lost you understand what i'm saying so if ashok lalan let's say wants to buy power then ashok lalan may think tamil nadu electricity board power supply is erratic no let us buy from so and so so then i have to i have to apply to tamil nadu electricity board then uh, they will uh, say okay you pay all these charges then you can use it it's like you know paying a rent or something for the usage of the line this is called open access then i told you wherever private players come in you need a regulator you know since private generators have come in and possibly private distributors may have come in private transmission fellow also may have come in you need a regulator so there is a state energy regula- electricity regulatory commission in each state and a central electricity regulatory commission crc in the center so there are two regulators one for the center one for the states and this act also said metering is compulsory no more you know fooling around without meters and all that and power theft it made it a criminal offense and highly punishable you understand these are all the this is the sum and substance of the electricity act i'll read quickly the generation distribution and transmission of electricity were carried out mainly by the state electricity boards in states due to political compulsions low or no tariffs for agricultural sector cross subsidization of the agricultural and household sectors by the industrial and commercial sectors and huge atc losses they reached unsustainable levels in almost you know this funda due to political compulsions farm tariffs were zero or low household tariffs were low commercial and industrial were cross subsidizing them atc losses not transmission losses and commercial losses were high 
and a lot of people theft and all are going on. The Electricity Regulatory Commission Act, this was done by Vajpayee, this 2003, it was a damn good act, you know, it's a very important act. The Electricity Regulatory Commission's Act was enacted in 1998 for distancing state governments from tariff determination. Electricity Act was enacted in 2003 to consolidate the laws relating to generation, transmission, distribution, trading and use, promote competition by bringing in private players, protect the interests of the consumers, supply electricity to all areas, rationalize electricity tariff, ensure transparent policies regarding subsidies, promote efficient and environmental brilliant policy, <coughs> constitute regulators. It's a competency. Okay. The Act delicensed power generation completely, except for all nuclear and hydroelectric projects over a certain size. First thing is, generation was delicensed. Second, licenses are required for transmission, distribution and trading. Third, generators can sell power directly to any licensee and were allowed by state regulatory commissions to consumers directly. That is, I can sell directly to any company, to any licensee, but consumers only if I am permitted, you know. The Act provides for open access in transmission and distribution on payment of necessary charges. Open access allows large users of power to buy cheaper power either bilaterally or through an energy exchange. The idea is that customers must have a choice among a large number of competing power companies instead of being forced to buy electricity from their existing electric utility. Open access helps ensure regular supply of electricity at competitive rates. And I already told you what open access is. See, so now as a consumer also, let's say Ashok Leland, Previously, it could buy only from Tamil Nadu City Board and the supply will be erratic. Now, supposing I have ILFS has put up a power plant, somebody X has put up a power plant, Y has put up a power plant, Ashok Leland can buy from any of these. You understand? So, the consumer also has more choice. And But for the open access policy, these, because of the open access policy, Tamil Nadu Electricity Board must make its transmission and distribution lines available to the private players also, but on payment of charges. There are also two energy exchanges, you know, like stock exchange, there are also two energy exchanges. You can do electricity, buy electricity in two ways. Either, I, supposing I have a power plant, Ashok Leland can either buy directly from me bilaterally, or it can go to the energy exchange, like a stock exchange, energy exchange will also have company A, you know, so much of power available, this is the tariff. Company B, company C, it can go to the energy exchange and buy power from the energy exchange. You understand what I'm saying? There are two ways of buying, either directly or from energy exchange. State government should unbundle electricity boards, that is, separate the generation, transmission, and distribution activities. It mandated a central electricity commission and a state electricity commission, regulatory commission. They are responsible for prescribing tariffs for generation, transmission, and distribution, issuing licenses, regulating electricity purchase, adjudicate disputes, specify standards. Understand, supposing uh, license is needed for transmission and distribution, you have to apply to the state electricity regulatory commission, and then they give the license. And supposing uh, Ashok Lelan wants to buy from me, and the Tamil Nadu Electricity Board is creating a problem, then you apply to state electricity regulatory commission, they will, inter they will adjudicate the dispute, they will say jolly well give, when I mean, you shall not say no. It created an appellate tribunal, it made metering mandatory, prescribed stringent penalties, recognized trading as a distinct activity, gave a thrust to complete rural electrification, gave a thrust to renewable energy, the central government to prepare national electricity policy. Once in five years, central government comes out with a national electricity policy. Okay, the last item is Ujjwal Discom Assurance Yojana. I'll just tell you briefly, you can read it yourself. So what it says is, <coughs> basically, under the Electricity Act 2003, you unbundled the three. Okay. In uh, generation, no license, so anybody can enter. But in uh, transmission and distribution, license is needed. So that means private parties can't enter freely. Orissa and Delhi, they privatized distribution also. Okay. Orissa and Delhi, they privatized distribution also. If you remember, Sheila Dixit became unpopular because the private distribution companies, they were charging high electricity rate, they were cutting, uh, you know, electricity board at least is a little humane and uh, this one. The, these fellows are simply cutting off the, the, like your mobile phone. If you don't pay, they simply cut off. So, Kejriwal made a big issue out of this and one of the reasons why he came to power was this privatization of the distribution company in Delhi. So, learning from Orissa also, there are a lot of problems. So, learning from the Orissa and Delhi example, many states said, 
okay, we will unbundle the three, but we'll keep distribution and transmission only with ourselves. We'll not, we're only in the public sector, we'll not make it private. In the rare case, if big industry wants a transmission line or something, we'll give a license, you understand? So most of the states kept distribution uh, thing with themselves. And as you know, all those problems of cross subsidy, low tariff, high theft, because of that, most of these distribution companies are bankrupt. They have high dues, they have a lot of bank loans, you know, they are bankrupt. Now, because they are bankrupt, they are not able to buy power. You saw that private companies had a PLF of only 60%. One of the reasons is the distribution companies are not buying from the private companies. They are first buying from the state um, generation or central generation company, only last they go to the private. Private rate also is usually higher. So, what is the point of my putting a power plant? Okay, because of open licensing, uh, what are the open access? I have the access to the transmission and distribution line, but the fellow doesn't have money. The distribution company doesn't have money. So I am not able to sell my power. So Piyush Goyal, when he was Minister of Power in this government, they came up with a scheme called Ujwal Discom Assurance Yojana, you know, Udai. Basically what it says is, the financially troubled distribution companies, it's a bailout package for them. It says 75% of their bank loan will be taken over by the state government and uh, bonds will be issued. Remaining 25%, the bank will either give a concessional low interest rate or the, those fellows will issue a bond, the DISCOM will issue a bond. Basically, it's a bailout package, so they'll have, uh, they'll start from a clean slate. You know, basically it's like that. So, it is uh, voluntary, it is no compulsion on any state to join. But most of the states have now joined. Initially, some states said no, this and that. But the condition is, the government of India has put the condition that you should be strict in metering, you should be strict in uh, preventing power theft, you should bring down ATC losses, and you should stop this cross-subsidization. You know, too much of subsidization of uh, this one, you should stop. Now, because of these conditions, many states held out. They said, no, 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 we are not agreeable to these conditions. But now, finally, almost all of them have agreed. So, you understood what is Uday? Uday is basically a financial rehabilitation package or a bailout package for the financially stressed distribution companies. Most of them are still in the public sector. Now, if there are multiple distribution companies, say three, four, five, like airlines or whatever, you know, then maybe public sector distribution company might have died in the course of time. The others might have flourished. But most of the states have not allowed any private distribution companies to come in after learning from the Delhi experience and the Odisha experience. So because of that, we are saddled with a, though we have de-licensed generation, we are saddled with a public sector distribution company which is sick. And this sick company cannot buy power from the, though power is available, they can't buy. Now hopefully after Uday, they will become all right. They will also be in a position to buy. Okay? Thank you. I hope you are clear about these three sectors.